And hello and welcome everyone to the comic multiverse where the worlds of nerd meet. As always, I'm your host, Joel and Matt. It's a sleepy week again. It's the second week after San Diego Comic-Con. And once again, there is almost nothing going on in the world of comic book news. Nothing whatsoever. There's a couple of big things, but nothing really like world shaking. Nothing to build a show around, and I know no. this is the time of year where other comic book shows would be like, it, fuck it, we're not even going to do a show this week, or, you know, we're just going to slumber until then, but that's that's not the comic multiverse way. That's not the way we do things. No, it's not. We promise you a show every week, and we deliver, and patrons, you know, they pay a dollar a month so they can listen to it first, and damn it, this is what we did, it's what we're going to do, it's what we're going to keep doing, and then we're going to go back to Washington, and we're going to take back the White House. <laughs> Remember Howard Dean, everybody? He was a presidential hopeful who fucked up because he got too excited at a rally and went, <laughs> Ruined his whole uh, career. Uh, so many careers like that have been ruined by like one, like a word or like one, one gap. Mis- mis- miscommunicated handshake or something. It seems hilarious by today's standards where it's like, really? You mean he didn't even say anything racist on Twitter or didn't even deny the Holocaust no. and it ruined his career? Nah, nah, he just got too excited one time. Yeah, he just made like a weird noise and everyone he, got like really scared of it or something. I, I bet that dude just kicks himself now where he's like, man, if only I stayed in it a little while longer, I so would have been <laughs> the lesser of so many evils. He would have been a whole big meme and it would yeah, have been cool. Really- he would have been the Ken Bone of his day. <laughs> Talk about another guy who's absolutely forgotten now. Yeah, that's a name I haven't heard in a while. <laughs> I've not heard that name in many moons. <laughs> uh, but yes, believe it or not, everyone, we are a comic book podcast. Sometimes. A lot Sometimes. of the times. Sometimes. But, you know, I like to think the comic multiverse, you know, it's a multiverse of topics. You know, comics, that's just the jumping off point, man. That's just the thing where everything crosses over in the big Venn diagram that is nerd Yeah, yeah well, comics now cover lots of different, like, genres. TV, movies, games, books. Naturally. Music, all that oh, yeah. sort of stuff. It's it's true. It's absolutely true. But uh, how uh, how's your week been, Matt? What have you been up to? Uh, pretty good. I people probably people wouldn't know this but t- 10 minutes ago i was sitting at work uh, <laughs> and I, I had to uh, rush home uh to do this um but yeah I, i've been just working been uh playing D over the weekend that's right ironically we both had big D yeah games it just fell on week. the same weekend <laughs> P- people assume it's like oh were you guys doing this together no actually but it's hilarious <laughs> we did it together we probably would have if we could have gotten the time zones still yeah. on it. But yeah, this this was your first game ever, Matt. I am fascinated. Well, Do tell me all about well, it. It wasn't my first game. It was my first game of, for, for like 10 years. Like right. I, I played originally like at a preset character, at like some event thing. But yeah, this was like my first game in 10 years playing with like the new version 5 stuff. Yeah. And it was, it was pretty fun. It was pretty fun. It is. I, uh, I I like 5e a lot. I know there's a lot of, like, nerdy turf wars about mm-hmm. what version of D&D yep. is better. I know 4, version 4, ruffled a lot of people's feathers because mm-hmm. they changed a lot of it to be like MMOs, where it's like, okay, well, everyone has to be able to heal, and everyone has to have a set amount of moves and maneuvers, or else they won't feel like they're doing anything. You know, we got to make it feel like an MMO. For 5, they stripped a lot of that out. Yeah, there, there was like, you've got to look after these 10 dozen timers with all these yeah. things that reset every half day and every day and yeah that's not in there anymore thank god yeah it, it's much easier to pick up and play now i uh i finally uh in my D project uh shit so i didn't have to get off the pot about a project i've been working on forever because i'm like man I really like the Adventure Zone, and I really like Critical Role and Harmontown and all these other things. And normally, when I like a thing, I end up doing that thing. It's the whole reason I'm a YouTuber <laughs> and have a podcast. And, you know, the, the world hasn't really uh, shoveled much failure in my face yet about this, but maybe maybe now is the time I can do a D&D show, which is hilarious the day I chose to do this. The Hard Times dot uh, net which is a hilarious twitter channel and parody website had a whole joke article there where it's like you know be sure be sure to adopt a dungeons and dragons podcast instead of starting your own there's so <laughs> many unloved ones out there on the internet and i'm like damn it hard times why did you have to do this today <laughs> they knew they fully they did you. 
I guess they did. But yes, I finally got it done. It's called Capes and Quests. You can listen to the first two episodes right now if you are a patron. Uh, again, you can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month. It's always much appreciated. Seeing some good uh, feedback on that, it's uh, myself. Professor Thorgy from the channel Professor Thorgy. Me and him enjoy working with each other and just really needed a project. It was his first time playing too, actually. Oh, nice. So a bunch of us is the first time. And it was my first time DMing. And he's like, uh, you sure you want me, Joel? Because, you know, I've never played before. I'm like, that's fine. I've never DMed before. It'll be the blind leading the blind. It'll be great. <laughs> Uh, Kirk FM from Panel Patter. You've probably seen him on Twitter a bunch. He's very well known in the comic Twittersphere. Again, dude who I've known literally forever, but never actually had the chance to collaborate on a project. It's the first time I ever actually spoke to him on something that wasn't Twitter. Yes. And uh, Josh Johnson, our comedian buddy who's been on yes. the show before. He never played either, but goddamn, he is super funny. <laughs> <laughs> in that he, I, I, I dare say he made it with just his general not giving a fuck. <laughs> that was basically me yesterday as well, because I, I was playing a, a uh, rogue arcane trickster, and just like the nice. first thing I did was break into a warehouse and steal rum and then blame nice. a dwarf. <laughs> There you go. See, that's that's where the great D&D bit happens. Uh, again, to get people really interested to this, in episode two of the series, uh, I get Josh's character. He's playing a Catman cleric. Uh, I get him hooked on fantasy cocaine in the second episode. <laughs> oh, nice. Good old physic. Good, yeah, or fade dust, as I call it. I didn't want to be that obvious, but yes, I got him hooked on it. And I'm like, okay, so you know, this will make your physical skills great, but you'll take a hit in all your like uh, interpersonal mental skills. And he's like, all right, but I can keep the party going. Yes, yes. <laughs> so the rest of the episode is just like, yes, okay, so we'll fight these bandits. Do they have drugs on them? Like, well, I guess they got like a bumper tooth. It's all I need. <laughs> That's great. And I'm, and I'm like, see, now you've created a timeless character, this drug-addicted cat man <laughs> who does drugs for Jesus. <laughs> Look, my, my death god wants me to do this. <laughs> we, uh, ironically, uh, what is it, uh, Kirk's character w was a rogue, which usually the rogues are the chaotic ones who get into trouble. He ended up being the voice of reason, which should let you know what just a band of deplorable outlaws <laughs> was in this campaign. <laughs> Look, well, we'll I, on, on mine i chose a high elf rogue so like everyone else is like incredibly racist to my character <laughs> naturally fantasy racism the only good racism <laughs> <laughs> ah the elves don't like the dwarves and the elves don't like the humans and the nobody likes the tieflings and the half orcs <laughs> i always play half orcs and everything i always like to play the monstrous races for whatever yeah. reason that's my big role they, they're pretty fun they, they're always a good good uh jumping on point there I think there's something to be said about in a fantasy campaign and from a storytelling character making point of view to automatically know where you stand with people mm -hmm. to not have to figure it out to be like, oh, I'm half orc. I'm a tiefling. They're going to hate me just from the jump because I am the way I am. Yeah, yeah. You can build a lot of interesting characters around that where it's like, oh, will I hate them back or will I try and be suave and charming or, you know, intimidate them into liking me? <laughs> a lot of places to go, but... Uh, for people who are interested in Capes and Quests, that will be up somewhere where non-patrons can watch it eventually. I actually want it to look really good, and I took some time to edit it with, like, you know, sound effects and, like, cool music and shit. And I'm currently in the process of uh, trying to commission some artwork to go with it, actually. Oh, nice. We're, we're going to try and we'll, we'll find out a, a way to, to get me, me involved, because I, I, I just yeah. want to come in and just cause havoc with Josh. <laughs> oh, it'll be it, it, it'll be great. Here's the thing. I I, I imagined it like I wrote one campaign because it's my first time ever writing a campaign. I'm like, all right, I want something that can be done in one or two sessions. And once it's finished, I can tour that around as like a pilot and be like, OK, here's the pilot for a and d show. Would you like more of this? And then we'll call the next one like season two or something. Cool. Did you end up using like D&D &D Beyond at all? Uh, a little bit, mostly I theater of the mind. It. I did take some stats from there, but I also changed it around because everyone was level one, and naturally I didn't want to kill everyone right off the bat. <laughs> oh, that's no fun. No, I would. Oh, I'd be the worst DM. I. I no. No quarter given. 
None if whatsoever. It makes, if it makes you feel better, Matt, I tried to do that, but my dice roll still ended up being so high I almost <laughs> killed them all anyway. Literally, <laughs> the the first roll on the first encounter was, oh no, some desert jackals have snuck into your camp in the night. What happens? Critical, uh, like critical 20 right off the bat. Oh no, and you're level one. That kills you instantly. Oh no. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> and you're the healer. Fuck. <laughs> Why did the healer go to investigate the growling in the night? <laughs> God damn, you are first timers. But no, it was it was a lot of fun. So uh, yeah, that's I guess that's just what our week has been. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the only piece of news actually worth talking about that happened this week before we get into the Q and A segment of our show, which uh, thanks again to all the fans who were nice enough to uh, ask some questions. Uh, Kevin Conroy, we discovered this week, is going to be involved in the Crisis crossover for the CW. Yeah, th- th- not not just as like he's just not voicing Bruce Wayne; he's playing him. That's amazing, Kevin Conroy, as I'm going to assume an old Bruce Wayne. Oh. Not that I don't think he's good enough of an actor that he can't play a young he's Bruce playing, Wayne. He's playing 19-year-old Bruce Wayne. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> he whoa, could do whoa, it. Whoa. What is up, fellow children? <laughs> uh, it's yeah. me, Batnark. <laughs> this, this, is, this is pretty awesome. This is automatically makes him the best bat- live-action Batman it is Already. just default, by showing up just by default um, again this this is the good shit this is what i keep talking about when i say no one ever gives the cw shows no. their due the live action movies wouldn't do shit like no, this but no. the cw universe does because they actually kind of know what the fans want and again who doesn't love kevin conroy yeah and uh well, not only that like um like just like the things they're doing in in just this crossover like not mentioning like the stuff they did in like Elseworlds and Crisis on Earth X and all that stuff, but like this one we've got oh, yeah. like Kingdom Come Superman, we've got Anti Monitor, Monitor, this old Bruce Wayne, which I imagine will probably be, be the Kingdom Come Batman, maybe. Assumedly, I, I guess so. Yeah, there's a lot of places so they we could, could take potentially it. have the Kingdom Come Trinity. Ooh. If they end up getting Linda Carter or someone to play Wonder oh. Woman, that'd be oh, awesome. I, I, I really hope they do. Who who was the actress from that CW Amazon pilot that never got picked up? Oh yeah, um, she was. What's her name on Agents of Shield? Um, That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's so, look. Yeah, let's work her in, and let's also work the Aquaman actor from the Smallville Aquaman <laughs> spinoff that never happened. Let's get oh, them in there. That, that would be a bit weird because that Aquaman spinoff was actually the guy who played green arrow in aqua in smallville so it'd be like oh really to- it'd be totally weird for him to come back to play aquaman instead of playing green arrow ah <laughs> uh, that'd be funny though i'd like yeah, that it where be. it's like he he meets steven and mouth's like you look familiar you look familiar <laughs> <laughs> again there's like again if we're gonna do it this and it's just gonna be a big larf like again let's just get everyone involved obviously people want tom welling here naturally yeah well apparently he's been cast in season the last season of arrow apparently so maybe 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 he's I'd, I'd love to have michael rosenbaum come back but oh. i'd like i'd like to have him come back but as flash oh interesting because he was in the cartoon wouldn't that be something or michael rosenbaum comes back but he's now the good son of lex luther from one of the other crises yeah. now he's alexander luther well, i i hope they do that because we're, we're getting john cryer in there as as mm. lex so yeah they could bring him back as bring him in as like alexander luther yes i'm the good luthor from another universe yeah. there's just so many fun places you could go with this it's, it's even better because they even got marv wolfman to co-write the 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 shows as well so it's it's the guy who made this event the man who literally wrote the book on crises <laughs> is going to be writing this crossover event on crises oh it's gonna be so good it's beautiful it's a great moment cannot wait although i do fear that we're building it up too high because i'm like mm, i hope it i hope it lives up to that because I, I, I like to think that like they they realize what they have here and they re- realize that they they're going to need more money and stuff like that for effects and everything and i, I think i i have faith in them because as it stands right now i think the best crossover they did was that like uh 
invasion of Earth X or versus Earth X where they fought their evil Nazi counterparts and it was like mm-hmm. a four night event and they even like was even shot and paced like a movie. I think that's still like the toppest one. Like that's the best one. Yeah, that I did like that one as well. I like the one with the Dominators as well and El- Elseworlds was really cool as well. Dominators is fun. It gets a little uh, hard to follow in the middle because like again, Legends of Tomorrow wasn't a full on comedy yet. It didn't quite know what mm-hmm. it was doing. Yeah. The, do- the the final battle in the Dominators one is pretty strong. It is, yeah. When they're all together on the rooftop, that's like their Avengers everyone getting together moment. And apparently there's rumors too. I don't know if this is confirmed or if this has just been wishful thinking, but yes, Black Lightning will actually be involved yeah, in this one it, finally. It's, it's confirmed, yeah. Cool. Now that he's involved, Ooh. fuse the damn universes at the end of it so Supergirl and Black it, Lightning can just live in the main universe, please. It's Crisis of Infinite Earths. I imagine it's going to do that. Because if you don't, what's the point of doing it? And yeah. even though I don't wa- even though I haven't watched Black Lightning since like halfway through season one, not because I didn't like the show, but because I was busy. But goddamn, you're leaving money on the table here <laughs> with that. All the heroes need to be in the same universe, and it'd be great because I remember when we when we learned that that show wouldn't be in the same universe, we we said how big of a missed opportunity that was because black lightning he's like that older hero he could be the mentor to like flash and supergirl and all these other people even just to offer a different perspective where it can be like hey all you all you damn 20 somethings with your 20 something problems i got kids and a job and an ex-wife and shit to deal with (laughs) Can, can we get this done please yeah put that shit about who's dating who this week in the back of your mind that's who gives a shit yeah we gotta fight some aliens damn it <laughs> And also, too, how come you guys don't come to my neighborhood and help out? You ever notice? Like, oh, Black Lightning. <laughs> That's our Black Lightning. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Black Lightning asking that. Isn't that a sketch or something? I want to say that's like, uh, what is it? The guy who, uh, he's got a comedy center. I want to say that's a bit where he had a, where he played a Black Lightning-esque character on the Justice League. Being like, yeah, why doesn't the Justice League come to my neighborhood and help out? <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, I'm very excited for that crossover and also yeah. kind of excited too, to be like, all right, what's the next phase of these CW shows going to be now that arrow looks like it's going away. Flash is losing many of its supporting cast. Yeah. And probably coming towards an end at some point. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued to see what their next batch of shows will be. I imagine it'll be stuff spinning out of these shows, but I really can't think of what yeah i mean it's also kind of like the wild west now too where it's like yeah sure dc says they're gonna be making more movies now and everything but you know Mm -hmm. when's that gonna happen yeah which is probably why we can have stuff like batman and stuff now yeah why we can actually have them now but yeah i mean obviously batwoman is kind of a no-brainer replacement for arrow especially when Mm -hmm. we stop and consider that arrow basically used so many of the c and d list batman villains already yeah it basically built it's 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 show base off of that like the first two seasons were like purely like batman villains yeah to where it's like hey we are poor man's batman which is hilarious because that's what's comic green arrow has always fought against (laughs) being called a poor man's batman yeah but yeah that's an obvious replacement what could replace flash down the line what kind of hero do you think they have who could kind of fill that void i know there's been talk forever about like well what about a green lantern show or something on television because you know we keep talking about ferris and all this other stuff and everything and clearly as far as uh, movies go green lantern done did a bad bad thing and you know <laughs> 2020's coming up and i don't see any new green lantern movie news um yeah i could i could see that i could honestly see them doing something like in the comics where they bring back the the red-headed wally west somehow because mm, i right. somehow i don't think that uh, the the guy who played wally on the show wants to come back or like he, he clearly he does a lot or of personal doesn't demons or, yeah it, it it's very up in the air now so they they could go with that and have him as a supporting role if he wants to ever come back and do like the whole two wallies sort of thing right. um uh i i guess with like batwoman you could probably do like a robin or a nightwing show maybe Ooh, inch well i know lucius is gonna be on there so i wonder yeah. is he gonna be batwing well, i don't know because in that trailer he looks like a bumbling idiot so uh, yeah i i would definitely like uh what is it flame bird if they could work flame mm. bird in somewhere yeah 
Yeah, you bring up an interesting point there about him being a bungler. I forget who wrote it online. I don't know if it was uh, Blurds Without Fear or one of the tw- or Black Heroes Matter. One of the Twitter feeds I follow, they said something rather interesting I didn't consider before to the effect of like, okay, it's cool. CW shows that you have such colorblind casting and you have all these different, you know, characters from all these different backgrounds. But why are they always tech support for the white heroes? Well, not not only that. Why are they always tech support who are like idiots more or less like because the uh, the guy who plays mr uh terrific on on arrow was basically that except they kept saying oh he's an olympic level athlete and all that and it's like but he kept he's like you know he's got like uh mr magoo hands and all that oh, sort of no. stuff and yeah oh no yeah I, there's something i hope they fix but yeah you, you could do bat wing it would be cool to see them do flame bird, especially because of the whole Kryptonian connection to the mm-hmm. Nightwing and the flame bird, because mm-hmm. I think another reason they really want Supergirl to be in the same universe as Batwoman is because they really want to do a world's finest crossover between those two. Yeah. Yeah. I, which would be very interesting. I, I, I'd like to see that. I'd like to see them as well. Like with doing stuff like that and introduce people, stuff like power girl and like Huntress and all those Huntress characters would be cool yeah did, like a, like a they did huntress on on arrow but it was but like she wasn't great yeah it wasn't uh, she like every time it, she'd pop up she'd, they'd be like oh no she's back to kill him again you can oh, you no. can do the other version of helena bertinelli if you want yeah the proper one yeah or you could do the one who's in the comics now who they retrofitted to becoming that version anyway yeah, yeah there's lots of I, I saw some people say because um in the last crossover we let lois is pregnant that super mm. sons will be around but like that's not how like people growing up works no um, it feels like wishful thinking not that i wouldn't love the idea yeah and it, th- there's also the the funny ironic thing about like them wanting to hit him grow up so fast so they can be on the show whereas in the comics is opposite <laughs> Uh, actually it, it kind of would be fun too because you don't know how far along the batman is in this universe if he could be like oh hey uh so i can't be on the show right but hey uh kate you know my cousin everything uh my son damien is coming to town would you please take care of my son damien oh god <laughs> <laughs> that would be hilarious have a batwoman and damien show because you know batwoman wouldn't put up with any of damien's shit no no she wouldn't at all <laughs> And she's like, look, we're technically family, so I guess I technically have to take care of you. I, I, I'd, I'd, like I was saying before, I'd like a, like a Nightwing show and maybe have Damien in that. So, like, Dick has mm. to be, like, his big older brother and father figure. Unfortunately, I think with Titans, that's going to be a hard sell right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually completely forgot he was on Titans. <laughs> don't we? Don't we all? <laughs> that comes back in a month, apparently. I know it does, which, again, they're working on that really fucking hard, because if you follow uh, Brian Edward Hill, the comic writer who also consults and writes on that show, he, like, just got back from Toronto where they were rapping, filming on them. Like, really, you're just, you're just rapping now and the show's coming? It's like, are, are you editing this, like, 24-7? And it, as it's filming, they're, like, cutting it to real time. <laughs> I guess. I wouldn't be shocked, because I'm sure DC Universe, the app, is like, we need content. As soon as Swamp Thing is done, we need we need oh, content. We need so, another thing. Swamp Thing's done. I know it is. It finished just recently. Yeah, and, and it, going back. It, I wouldn't bother. It ended on a season two cliffhanger. I, I heard that, that it really <laughs> shits the bed in the end for a continuation that's never going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Do, do they tease the Floronic Man? I know I heard yeah. people talking about the Floronic yeah, Man. Yeah, and you see the costume, and he kills a character who's been in the show the whole whole season. He kills him off camera. I feel like I should almost watch it just because it would be an interesting video, because I can think of the title right now. Swamp Thing, the show that died on the vine. <laughs> just how many plant puns can I get into one video? <laughs> Oh, but you know, this rose had a thorn, I'll tell you about that. Yes, it completely soiled itself. Oh, but dumb t- See, look how easy this is, Matt. <laughs> this is great. Oh, uh, b- 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 was it much or was it mulch? Let's find out. <laughs> pine. <laughs> Swamp-, Swamp Thing pines for Abigail. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Oak. Oh, I'll figure it out. We'll write it later. <laughs> They're not all going to be winners, okay? <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I guess that's what we did this week. That's the one story we talked about. Do we want to take uh, want to take some questions, Matt, for the fan base at large? Yeah, sure. 
All right, first question we got here is from at Baron Chugs, longtime fan and follower of the show. Uh, if either of you have been to the States, what major difference have you seen as far as food is concerned? See, I like these outside the box questions. I'm some I'm glad some fans didn't keep it just to comics. I like when we get to go on little tirades. Yeah, I'm um, uh, I actually haven't been outside the state uh, been to the states, I mean. I don't feel bad, Matt, because I've only been to the States within the last couple years, and I've gone multiple times. I did New York, I did Philadelphia, I did Seattle. Uh, yeah, those are the three American cities that I've visited. Oh, I went to Florida a long time ago, but uh, yeah, y you do notice some stuff with food. For one, portion size is out of fucking control in America, <laughs> and I love it. I love that portion <laughs> sizes are out of control. I love that I can order an appetizer, be full, take my dinner home, and then that could be my breakfast in the morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, where you order a small and they back up like a dump truck. Every Everything is bigger in America, and that's <laughs> A-OK -okay with me. Uh... What is it? You, you, you guys have different theories about hash browns because, uh, you know, some places you'll get like breakfast potatoes or, you know, like home fries. But most places in the States, it's like the really shredded mm -hmm. potatoes and everything like the Denny style potatoes, you would call yeah. here. We don't really do that as much in Canada. Yeah, or we don't we do, do that. We, or if we do, we do it closer to uh, to the border towns and everything. It's, it's an interesting difference. Oh, man, uh, uh, iced tea. Let's talk about America and iced tea for a second. Here, when I order an iced tea, they will give me a sweetened iced tea. When I order an iced tea in the States, they give me cold tea that I have to sugar myself. <laughs> oh, jeez, really? Yes. Appa <laughs> apparently, what you want to order in the States, and I didn't find this out until later, what you want to order is a sweet tea, not an iced tea. They're different things, apparently. Okay, then. <laughs> I know. Is that not just madness <laughs> again it's, it's got to be a former colony thing canada and australia the british are like no all tea will have sugar in it <laughs> we're not we're not monsters <laughs> we're not going around colonizing places for people to not put sugar in their tea <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that's that's a funny thing uh just just some different brands and everything like obviously i'm sure if your household is anything like mine hp sauce is a cornerstone of breakfast yes you gotta get your brown yes. sauce on your eggs and everything americans they've never heard of it yeah they're uncultured when it comes they, to stuff like that they'll have a ton <laughs> of hot sauce on the table they'll have several different types of tabasco red tabasco green tabasco chipotle no hp sauce yeah and it's it's very strange yeah or even still like places here as well like if you like ask for it they'll be like what's that mm. it's it's very weird and i know a lot of our american fans are like hey it's pizza that's weird. google it it's house of parliament sauce it is a brown british breakfast sauce that they only gave to their favorite colonies and their favorite <laughs> acquisitions you you guys fought a rebellion and you lost your hp sauce privileges <laughs> yeah. forever <laughs> Yeah, they give it to all the all the colonies that didn't they didn't have to fight a war over. <laughs> yeah, that they only asked nicely, <laughs> and you got that taken away from you. Uh, lots of different types of soda over there, like mm -hmm. several different flavors of Mountain Dew that I have only heard of in hush whispers. Yeah, we only get one flavor here. Damn, and uh, it's an Mountain and it's like an energy drink flavor. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What what was it I had when I was there? Mountain Dew Cold, uh, Code Black which mm -hmm. tasted like cough syrup. It tasted like uh, it was trying to hurt me when I drank it, but obviously <laughs> I drank the whole thing because it's also highly addictive. Yeah, well, we we can get them, but you've got to go to, like, specialty stores that, like, yeah. sell, like, American products, and, and, and they're ridiculously priced as well. I really want to start a series, but it is not cost-effective. Trust me, I've tried. Where I try sodas from all over the world live on stream, the only problem with that is is that, as I've discovered, soda weight is liquid weight, and liquid weight is the worst type of weight to transport, especially internationally. Yep. So you're basically doubling, tripling your price every time. Yeah, and you'll probably end up with diabetes. <laughs> and you'll probably end up with diabetes. I was, I was already thinking I was going to turn this into a stream show call it like uh epic cheat meal or something like that or something something cheat meal where it's like look i get to be bad once a week everyone and stop being keto so how about you fans send me shit and i will eat it i will mukbang it for your pleasure <laughs> and for ten thousand 
you know uh dollars raised you'll you'll get your leg amputated because of the diabetes <laughs> that uh, that's okay i don't need the ten thousand for it because we got socialized medicine here <laughs> That's, that's another thing I noticed about America, or at least something that I was sure not to notice. I was sure to get my blue cross and everything before mm-hmm. I went, because I'm like, God help me if I like take a header off the street or something, or if I get hit by a cab, I really don't want to go to an American hospital. Yeah. Well, not only that, if you get like a splinter, it's like, oh, that'll be, you know, $20,000 in extraction fees or something ridiculous, you know? Yeah, I, I, I'm <laughs> you, sorry. You what? sat in the hospital, so you have to pay us. <laughs> Another interesting thing about America, I don't know if this is true anymore, but it definitely was when I went there. The quality of their cans and chip bags is well below what it is here. Yeah. I don't know what that's about, if it's made from inferior steel or inferior plastic. I I guess when you have an army that's constantly at war, you need to take those products and put them into your tanks and, you know, your uniforms <laughs> and everything. Here, the Canadian government's like, what are we going to do? I don't know. Make, make pop cans stronger, I guess. <laughs> put put all production into pop cans i guess like i never understood it because you know like i'm sure if you've seen any american show or movie they're like yeah chug a lug beer and then they crush the beer can on their head you can't do that here because our cans are stronger yeah i'd probably die if i did that yeah you we would very much hurt ourselves matt and me if we did that uh, oh also no bags of milk over there no milk bags <laughs> that is the one seen. thing we don't have that that's just too fucking weird (laughs) bags of milk a uniquely canadian brand of weirdness i never knew that was a uniquely canadian weird thing until i like did a video where i showed my fridge and everyone's like bags of milk what (laughs) it's like so unweird to me like uh, in my house always growing up it was bags of milk never carton never bottle always bags of milk that just that just seems like a mess waiting to happen to me (laughs) It's, it's really not. It's an amazing uh, form of engineering. It's a bag. You put it in your milk holder. You cut the top off. You pour it in. You keep pouring it in. You throw out the bag. When you're done, put another bag in. I'll just buy a bottle of milk. <laughs> just or unscrew buy... the top and then put the top on. <laughs> well, here's the thing. You don't have to get the bags of milk. It's an option, so you can get, like, three six bags of milk all in one go if you want instead of having to buy like multiple quarts of milk all at one time Mm -hmm. i guess that's why maybe it's easier to store maybe it cuts down on waste i don't really know honestly why we do it yeah it's very strange i know there were there there was some other country that did like bags of soda when you go to like the 7-eleven like like the the, like slushy machine you don't get like the 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 um bottle you get like the a bag of slushy mix (laughs) interesting very interesting but yeah there's there's the portion size differences that i've certainly noticed when going to the states it is an amazingly wonderfully interesting topic and i love to find new things about the states every time i go to contrast and compare the differences yeah well one one thing i have noticed because i've um i've obviously gotten things from the states and that is like Mm -hmm. shirt sizes yeah so like i'll order the shirt size i am and i'll get it and i it happened actually recently to, to me i got it and i like checked it to make sure it's all right and i got it and it's like it's like a sleeping bag <laughs> it's so big so, size difference really is a thing and it's even crazier on the internet now because sometimes you won't look and be like oh am i getting this from the states am i getting this yeah. from asia an american large that's a canadian what and an asian yeah. whatever it's a whole freaking thing. But yeah, you're absolutely right about that. That's another big issue. Yeah, actually, come to think of it, I notice, uh, yeah, all the souvenirs I bought in the States have been like a size. I, maybe I thought I was doing really great, but they were always a size smaller. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've got to go like one or two sizes smaller than what you actually are in American sizes. Uh, security is another major thing <laughs> I noticed. I talked about this when I went to Philadelphia, but the hotel I stayed at, which was an incredibly nice hotel legion of security on every floor armed security and i'm just not used to seeing that in canada in canada you'll have like one door guy Mm -hmm. like one door guy hello goodbye everything but no here in philadelphia legions of armed guards on every floor and i'm like i guess you need this yeah we we don't have we like you would have like maybe a guy in the in the lobby maybe someone would come around like once a once every now and then but yeah and security guards like rarely have things that say like i am a security guard it's it's very it's very interesting uh 
even too, uh, convention security. Again, when I went to Seattle, when I went to Philadelphia, when I went to New York, they made you go through the metal detector, and it was like the airport and everything. They don't do that at our conventions here. If you go to Fan Expo, they don't make you go through a metal detector. Yeah, ne- neither neither here. You just, like, get your band, you go through the door. There's, like, security at the door that just, like, yeah. are, like, watching you. But then that, that you're in the show, and there's, like, barely anything wandering around, or at least that I've not seen. It's true. And, like, I stop and think to myself, I'm like, that's that's very trustworthy on the part of all our people, too, to be like, okay, everyone, just come right on through. That weapon's fake, right? Okay, you come right on through now. <laughs> don't don't you start no trouble, eh? What would Captain Canada do? That is one thing we have whenever we have, like, people with cosplay with weapons. When they go and get their band, they have to, like, show their weapon. We do have a weapons master, too, but again, uh, it's it's just so funny to contrast and compare. I remember I went to Seattle uh, right after that crazy dude tried to kill Jason David Frank, the Power Ranger. Mm-hmm. So, like, the security was turned, like, all the way up because they yeah. were on, like, red alert and shit. And it's funny, me being such a dopey-ass Canadian just came over from Victoria for the day. And I'm like, man, a lot of... L- 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 lot of police cosplayers out today and everything. That guy has a dog. I didn't even <laughs> He's know they let him into it. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, well, what are they supposed to be? They're supposed to be raccoon, uh, raccoon city police. Guard. Nope, that's uh, that's Seattle PD. Is what the... I don't know what series that's from. Do you guys know what series the Seattle PD was big? Oh, oh, I'm I'm an idiot. Okay, I'm just being an idiot. <laughs> that that is a real problem when you do go to conventions it's like are you, are you cosplaying as a cop or are you a real cop yeah <laughs> i literally cannot tell sometimes because <laughs> cosplay is so good now you didn't want to be like yeah. hey man can i have a picture that outfit's great <laughs> No, nah, man, I'm working. Oh, dude, you're really into character, man. <laughs> no, I will mace you. He's really into it. <laughs> oh, God, he's really macing me. Yeah, can I get a picture of you sprinkling crack over my son? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Tell your friends. <laughs> I, I do want to take another American trip, too. I'm thinking I want to, like, try and get to Michigan at some point because I figure, hey, border with Canada – I won't have to fly. Maybe I can just bus it over or something. Yeah, I got to get out to one of those shows. But the thing is, it's probably a bit cheaper for you. But like for me, I'm flying like across a continent. Yeah, you got to like take like an all day and night flight to get yeah. there. That's a major so it, thing. Very, very expensive. Heck, I've always wanted to visit Australia. I should come visit you at some point. <laughs> yeah, well, we got cons going on, so yeah. Yeah, we, we've worked together for how long and you and I have never actually met in person? Yeah, a long time. I think you you and I are our longest existing, like, internet relationship, working relationship. <laughs> it would be something even just to have a comic multiverse, like, in the same room. Yeah, a lot less, like, problems, probably. You know Though what, no, I bet... Knowing our luck. <laughs> knowing our luck, yeah. Oh, no, everything caught fire. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. Would I have to come in winter or would I have to come in summer? What's better? Nowadays, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> No, I guess not. <laughs> no, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> is is it always hot now? <laughs> it varies. It it depends like what what the day wants it to be. Like some days it'd be like I'm just gonna storm for like the whole week, and then then week after it's like forty degree heat all the time. <laughs> I, I I've said before I'm a couple hours away from Toronto. I'm like an hour drive and maybe like an hour more train ride. About how far are you from like the next major Australian city? Like twenty minutes. <laughs> Oh wow! Oh wow! Holy shit! You're you're right yeah. up in there. Now is that Sydney or is that another big major Australian? That's city? that's another big Australia. I'm nowhere near Sydney. Right, because when people think, and again, this is even my dumb ass here. When people <laughs> think Australia, they're like, "Oh, well, Sydney's obviously yeah. you know everyone. Major everyone city. in Australia lives around Sydney, <laughs> right? Because the Opera House, right? Because that's the only thing we ever yeah. see in anything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is really funny because like I watch movies like Thor Ragnarok, and I'm like, I've been on that corner of that street because they filmed in my city. Yes, they did. That's like whenever I watch Kick-Ass or something, when they're like, oh, you know, the, the greedy streets of New York. I'm like, motherfucker, the CN Tower's right behind you. <laughs> yep. You, you fucking bullshit. Or uh, what is it? Uh, Boondock Saints 2, where it's like, ah, oh, the greedy streets of Boston. Why is Ricky from the Trailer Park Boys here? Oh, my God, this is Toronto. <laughs> You can't lie to me. At least all the fantasy shows are like, oh, yeah, we're on Star City, you know, and oh, yeah, Central City. You're in Vancouver, but whatever. 
<laughs> Everything's in Vancouver now. It's fine. Everything is wooded area. <laughs> Everything is wooded area. I can't believe I was in Vancouver and I didn't make a try to try and get out to the woods somewhere and be like, oh, look, Gorilla City, it's right over here. <laughs> now, I didn't even stay in Vancouver when I went. I was in Richmond, a satellite city of Vancouver, because I wanted to save some money. I didn't actually appreciate how far away I really was. No, oh, really? <laughs> Yes, I stayed by the airport. I didn't really appreciate it. It's like, no, man, you got to take like a 50 minute cab ride, grab the Sky Train for half an hour to even be in the city. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and then the convention center was at the waters at the other end of the city. I'm glad I took the 20 minute walk through the city because if I didn't, I probably couldn't have said I actually <laughs> visited the city. <laughs> they had some lovely streets for walking around for the 20 minutes I did. <laughs> I wish I got a Jappa dog at Jappa dog. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, that's a very good question, uh, Baron Chugs. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad people ask some outside the box questions. All right, the next one we got here is from uh, Mike Chronic 420. Blaze it. <laughs> that's that's just his question. Blaze it. Uh, now, now Mike actually asked a real question. Uh, so, do you guys think DC is about to reboot again? Feels like Snyder is doing big things, and Doomsday Clock might finish around the same time a Year of the Villain does. Probably, if not not reboot, but like re like reorder everything, maybe. Yeah, again, you know, here, here's the funny thing. This this was a good question, Michael, and it really got me thinking about uh, Flashpoint. Flashpoint wasn't supposed to restart mm -hmm. everything. Flashpoint wasn't supposed to be this big event that took everything back to zero, but it became that when they felt desperate and felt it was a good time. Maybe what Snyder's doing isn't supposed to be a crisis. Maybe it isn't supposed to start everything back from number one, but maybe it will. Yeah, it, it all depends on, I guess, I guess it, it does come down to sales um, on, on certain things. And it's, pr that's probably like their contingency with that. They'll like do it. And it's like mm. in case, in case of book, book sales go down, break glass. And it's like the, the last issue somehow reveals they've gone back in time or something. I don't know. Or something. Yeah. And then, oh. and then Doomsday Clock, that just keeps getting pushed back and back because of like, I guess art changes because the script changes. So yeah. yeah. Uh, my theory too, is that we're getting very close to issue a hundred on many of these books now mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And I think we're definitely at a point in comics now where the companies fear issue a hundred plus. Yeah. So I would not be shocked at all if there was some inciting incident to take everything back to issue number one again. Yeah. That, that's what, like, I understand why they're doing it. They're doing it because they think, Oh, if you if a, if a new reader sees 100 issues they're not going to pick up or anything it's that's not exactly true um no but yeah it's just it's really frustrating especially when you go back not not that many years ago like maybe 10 years ago when we had we we're getting like like superman issue 250 and mm -hmm. all these all these books like reaching 200 300 400 and then yeah they just reset them all also, not to be dour or anything, but what new readers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I, I mean, you've tried doing it where you keep everything nice and simple and keep everything going back to number one to try and catch new readers. Are you really catching that many new mm. readers with it? Yeah. I actually quite enjoyed what Spider-Man did for years. And what I think Marvel is still doing, where it's like, okay, everything goes back to legacy numbering, Except for the ones that are number ones, but up in the corner, you have the real number. Yeah, yeah, I, I kind of like that. It, in a way, it is kind of a bit cheating as well to get yeah. to, like, certain, like, although in saying that DC did that with, like, Action Comics 1000 and DC Comic, uh, D Detective Comics issue 1000, but yeah, it's kind of cheating, but yeah, I can see that, that that's kind of, like, the best of both worlds, where, it, yeah, it's the new number one, but really it's issue, you know, 600 of this run. You, you, you raise an interesting point, too, with what uh, DC did with Action Comics and Detective Comics. It's like, oh, you know, we, we need new number ones because big numbers are scary. Oh, well, a thousand plus, that's a milestone. We need to <laughs> own that. Oh, really? Now you need to own it. Interesting. Yeah, and how are you going to do that in time? Oh, we'll just count this run that, like, everyone's not going to bother reading as, like, the extra 50-odd issues. <laughs> yep. Again, too, uh, I, I think, you know, until we actually see, like, some major creative shifts 
at DC, I don't think we'll be seeing any reboots anytime soon. I think everyone's going to be staying the course right now because they're not going to tell Bendis what to do and they're not going to tell all these other writers what to do. So they're just going to keep keep on keep it on. Yeah, I, again, like I, I hope I hope somewhere down the line somehow Jeff Johns gets back in as as like the the leader there it's just so they, he can write the ship like he did with Rebirth because Rebirth was a- amazing. Yeah, we'll call it Rebirth 2, Born Again. <laughs> oh no, not Born Again. Uh, it's getting really petty with Jeff Johns too, where it's it like, is. oh, issue 7 of Shazam pushed back 12 more weeks. What? Yeah, why? <laughs> yeah, because fuck them, that's why. Yeah, that, that'd be why. Like, I, I explained to people on Twitter, it's like, it's like why is Dan Didier, like, Hayden's like, oh, it's, it's a dick measuring contest, basically. and And we, the readers, suffer because of it. And, and why is Shazam evil now and infected because his yeah. book's being a, being a fun book for the whole family and his movie just came out? Why are you making him a bad guy now? Because fuck him, that's why. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, next up we got a question here from KT. Are there been any upcoming movies for the rest of the year that have caught your eye? Uh, yeah, a bunch, I'm sure. Matt and I see lots of movies that aren't just superhero movies. Uh, I want to see that new Tarantino one, but I haven't been able to get out yet to go see it. It's not even out here yet. It's not even out here for another, like, three weeks. We talked about this last yeah. week. I want I want to see that. Uh, the Irishman with Scorsese mm. and Pesci and De Niro, because, I mean, that's just a winning combination. That's the same team that brought me Casino and Goodfellas that are, like, two of my favorite movies ever. Yeah. Uh, the kitchen actually looks really good, based on a comic that I never read, but I really want to now. I, 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 I saw the trailer for that. And I'm like, wait, didn't I already see this movie? Wasn't this called like Widows or something? And it's like, it's basically the same film. Very similar premise. Which to myself, I'm like, wait, isn't this kind of like that Punisher story, Widow Makers? And it's like, <laughs> yes, kind of, okay, well, okay. So you're all you're all going from the same pile. But it's also a true story, and it's got Tiffany Haddish in it, and I love Tiffany Haddish. So you know, sign me up for that. And uh, but what's her name? Uh, lady who falls down all the time. Uh, McCarthy. <laughs> Lady who falls down. Yeah, Melissa McCarthy. <laughs> Melissa McCarthy, but playing like a sinister villain. And I'm like, oh, okay. I, I'm a big fan of this uh, uh, subgenre of when comedic <laughs> actors play more sinister roles. You know, Robin Williams did that a lot. Yeah, yeah. He he did some really great stuff uh, in the early 90s. But yeah, I mean, M. Tree, I know she did like that a recent movie that like got her like lots of praise around awards season. I didn't see because I wasn't interested because it was like a really hard drama um mm. but yeah apparently she was really good in that maybe that's like her her thing now right she well, okay, f- no she, more she falls down in dramas it falls down in dramas but you really feel the gravity <laughs> of it man you know people can make fun of melissa mccarthy all they want but here's the thing i discovered uh her and her husband write direct and produce most of the stuff she does so she's fucking cleaning up at the bank every time oh yeah yeah nice bit of she, nepotism there yeah, she plays dumb on screen, but she's clearly very intelligent <laughs> to know where her money comes from. I liked the puppet movie, too. Uh, what was that one? Uh, the Happy oh, Time Murder. I never saw that one. That one looks so stupid. It was, but a good type of stupid. If you if you like weird film noir parodies, you'll dig it. And also, here's the thing, too, about the Happy Time Murder. You can tell this is a concept that they shelled for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Because there's, like, a, a very important piece of information you find out about a show going into uh, syndication. And people are going to be making a lot of money off it. I'm like, oh, fuck, TV syndication? Jesus Christ. <laughs> How old is this script? <laughs> that's uh, that's like when you find uh, when there was all those uh, Lord of the Rings jokes in that uh, Seth Rogen movie about Korea. And you're like, well, how fucking old is oh, this yeah, movie? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That happens sometimes. You can tell how long a movie has been shelved by what cultural references they're making. Yeah, uh, other movies. Oh, I I recently just saw that that Hobbs and Shaw film. Oh yeah, yeah. Part of the expanded Fast and the Furious universe. <laughs> Fuck Fast and Furious. Just keep making these films. This film was utterly ridiculous, and I loved every moment of it. <laughs> I- Idris Elba played like a genetic super soldier. Yeah, yeah, no, he, yeah he's basically like like black captain america like he's got like all he's got like these eyes that can hack internet and all that stuff. He's, he's got a robotic bike that's like an ai drone that follows him around <laughs> all this like shit that's not in any of the other fucking films 
And R- remember when this series started as a low budget crime piece about drag racing cars in LA? Yeah, they were like the first film they were stealing like DVD players at the uh, VHS DVD combos. Yep. <laughs> and now it's like like this one the whole the whole thing about it is like there's like a virus or something that'll turn people into like to like him but like it'll only turn a certain type of person into him kind of like mm. a, a terrigen mist sort of thing um so an evil eugenics cult yeah yeah led by some unnamed person that has a shadowy past with the rocks character because of course and yeah, and, and cool. ryan reynolds is in it <laughs> really okay yeah. see here's the thing let me ask you this do i need to see any of the other fast and the furious movies to see this because the answer seems to be no no if you know who the rock and jason statham are then you you, you know this film <laughs> Because they're just playing The Rock and Jason yeah, Statham. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And also Roman Reigns is in it too. This is what yeah. he did when he got his whole, uh, what is it, cancer diagnosis and wasn't wrestling. This is what he went off to do. Yeah, he plays a background character in like the Samoan scenes. Related to The Rock because they are actually related in real life. <laughs> yeah, but it was an utterly ridiculous film. The Rock, The Rock pulls a helicopter out of the sky with his bare hands. <laughs> which he naturally can do because, and I, I, yeah. I said this on twitter because like originally when he before he was hired for fast five they wanted tommy lee jones in the role <laughs> and i'm like oh man can you imagine if like that happened but they like kept everything that the rock does <laughs> so like he's flexing out of like casts and like using mini guns and it's just tommy lee jones <laughs> it, it looks old like my man <laughs> To, uh, to put it in perspective, I forget who said this quote, but I stand by it. This looks like my kind of bollocks, is what this movie looks like. <laughs> it, it's it's absolutely fun. And it was directed by one of the guys who did John Wick. Really? Yeah, and the, I think the guy who did Deadpool 2. Oh, yeah, he's building quite a resume now, isn't he? Yeah, which, under, which is probably why Ryan Reynolds was in it. Ryan Reynolds and the guy, who, that, that normal guy in Deadpool 2 with the mustache, he's in oh, that as well. Oh, right. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. All right, I will definitely have to check that one out. What What's next in the Fast and the Furious expanded universe? <laughs> I, I, hopefully they go to space, fight like that's, drag racing aliens or something. I don't know. <laughs> that's really the only place they can go from there is to go to space or back in time. Yeah, yeah. They, they drive so fast around the Earth. The Earth spins around the opposite way and reverses Paul Walker's death or something. I don't know. Yeah. Or, or we go paranormal and the ghost of Paul Walker is now haunting <laughs> He's the rest of He's a ghost rider. <laughs> He's a ghost rider. So they need to actually get like uh, like their universe's version of Constantine to come and help them bust this ghost. <laughs> Vin Diesel goes to hell and fights Satan with a tire oh. iron. <laughs> Matt, you just, you just wrote <laughs> Summer's next big blockbuster, Diesel in Hell. Oh. <laughs> Look, listen here, Lucifer. Family corona respect tire irons (laughs) and then vin diesel ascended lucifer's throne to become the new lord of flies (laughs) all would know his name (laughs) okay look here satan i'm gonna challenge you to a game of D&D. roll them d20s wow they just let him do whatever the fuck he wanted here didn't they yeah you know that that, there was like a recent article that came out about how the rock and jason statham couldn't be defeated so many times or hit so many <laughs> times apparently there was one for like when vin diesel was doing the fast and furious movies where like each hit he he had to take would have a number associated with it but it was oh, a nice. but it was quickly thrown out because it was he made it too complicated i'm like yeah <laughs> he's a D player <laughs> naturally it's all numbers it's all math <laughs> But yeah, those are some movies we definitely like to see. Uh, as nerdy as it sounds, I've been watching a lot of PBS documentaries on Netflix recently. Nice. I watched I watched one on the circus that was really fucking good about like the history of the American circus. And then obviously because Netflix, you watch one thing, it like recommends you like a hundred more mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. I watched one on the history of uh, Irish gangsters in America that was pretty solid. I watched a really great one on Prohibition. Which, holy shit, that one explains so much to me about Prohibition that I didn't know. Like, the Temperance Movement got its name from the Knights Templar. Oh, okay. Which I'm like, well, that's pretty aggressive. Also, too, a lot of the women who were involved in that originally only kind of cared about Prohibition, but thought that it was a really good topic to galvanize a lot of women of the early, like, you know, 1900s and 20s and stuff to get out and become politically activated so Mm -hmm. they could vote. And I'm like, oh, that makes a lot of sense because you go from that 
right into the suffragette yeah. movement. And then, like, you hear shit that I've never heard before but makes a lot of sense where it's like, well, actually, a lot of people pushing Prohibition at the time were the rich, wealthy, white Anglo-Saxons really pissed off at how much money these new European immigrants were making in the booze business, particularly Germans, Anheuser, Busch, Schlitz, who owned all the big beer companies in America. And I'm like, oh, fuck, how did I never see that? Yeah, it makes a whole lot of sense, yeah. It really does. But how Prohibition got so fucked up by the end, you had, like, the KKK in favor of Prohibition, but you also had, like, black activists in favor of it, too, for two completely <laughs> different reasons. Jeez. And I'm like, wow, Prohibition is terrifying. And this happened for 14 years. <laughs> I, I watched, not in Canada, though. I, I watched a documentary on, on Netflix not too long ago about... um this guy who'd like apparently heard about like how someone had buried like like he, like kilos worth of cocaine and like a beach and like mm. him him he's like some construction worker him and like some like tweaker who lived on the island like went to try and find it and sell it they were just like two <laughs> random white guys just, and it, it was insane it, he ended up getting caught by the police and like it was all a big sting operation and all this sort of stuff it, it was really cool gotta find them drugs yeah because yeah he was like, gonna like get it and then he was gonna fly it himself down to, <laughs> and like just find someone to buy it <laughs> amazing yeah amazing netflix is great with documentaries and it like recommended me several more it's like would you like to see one on the civil war and i'm like well i feel like if i didn't know that much about the prohibition there's probably a lot i don't know about <laughs> civil war to all right hey would you like to watch this ken burns baseball documentary that's like 24 hours long ken burns and I'm man, like, his documentary is so good <laughs> i know it's like man i don't even like baseball but i'm probably gonna like this documentary <laughs> about it <laughs> yeah he can make like the most mundane thing seem like really mm. cool that Simpsons joke is so perfect. Ken Burns in a documentary about Ken Burns, the Ken Burns story. All I've ever loved in life is baseball and jazz. <laughs> uh, all right. Oh, that was a good question. Uh, all right. Longtime fan uh, Winford with another question. Uh, with the constant crying from the usual piss babies about more open diversity in comics media like Calderon Young Justice or Jane as Thor, what do you think the comic community and fans, both professional and non, can do to deflect negative press from a loud minority of assholes? Uh, I'm, you can tell Winford watches the show because he's picked up my dialect of loud <laughs> piss babies. If, if you take nothing away from this show, I'm glad that that is the blanket name I have given to all the usual offenders of loud piss babies. <laughs> I just don't pay them any attention. They, it's they, true. they they want you to pay them attention. They traffic in attention. They traffic in people like you know getting into fights with them. That's what they want because that gets more eyes on them. It's also true too that you know uh, ignorance and shit like that grows in the dark. And every so often you do need to shine a light on it, but do it to point and laugh because yeah. Lord knows they will give you a lot of material. And that's the other thing too. Most hate movements like this burn themselves out after a bit because you can only drink so much poison every day yeah yeah they but they or they like yeah paint themselves into a corner with things they've said that that, that make it so easy just to like deflect away you can't yes yeah, like, and well, then just laugh at and it's like why is anyone listening to this dude anymore because yeah. here's the thing the generation of piss babies now is completely different than the piss babies we had two, three years ago. And I'm mm. sure this group will be phased out too for another group of piss babies. Because it's a young man's game being an angry internet <laughs> piss baby, you see. It's, it's not for the old. And like, the, here's the other thing too about being a hateful person in general. Even if you create a community around hate, eventually you're going to hate the wrong things. And they'll hate you back. And then they'll eat each other. <laughs> You see it happen all the time, but uh, as for constructive shit you can do, like, really try and protect new and diverse voices there and try and, like, you know, megaphone the stuff you like. Because, you know, the only way you defeat negativity is with positivity, and that's why when I read something I really like, I go out of my way to be like, yo, this thing's fucking awesome, man. You should check out this thing yeah. that I like. Yeah, yeah, definitely, like, yeah, if you'd like something, say something about it, because chances are most people might not know about it. Absolutely, absolutely. 
Uh, all right, next up we got Marvel Knight, who actually asked quite a few questions here. Uh, when you read American comics that highlight the flaws in our country, does it make you all appreciate your own country's more? Man, we're getting some, like, complicated, serious <laughs> questions this week. Uh, how do I answer this and not sound like an asshole? <laughs> um, it's very interesting, especially, you know, if you read books like Captain America or Batman White Knight, which are very, very topical, very, very... Uh, pulled from the headlines i count myself lucky that i have like a layer between me and the subject matter which i feel kind of allows me to look at it a little bit more uh like non-biasedly because i'm not that close to the material mm -hmm. about it i can look at it like a little bit more objectively that's something i've always kind of liked about this and i feel you know outsider perspective third-party perspective is important sometimes in really heated uh issues and i kind of like to yep. feel that being canadian and probably being australian we can bring unique stuff to this because you know obviously in a lot of stories too where you know like american exceptionalism is on display i'm always the first to be like oh, yeah, it's, it's all nice and everything you know for captain america because he's captain america but you know you know showed up late to the war canada and australia were already fighting for a long time but yeah yes you won it all single-handedly it was all you yes, it, 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 no one did anything before you you did it all no one it was all you, the, the, you know, the, the allies was lots of people, but you know, whatever. And also, like, here's the thing, too. We're not so different, all of us, is the way I feel about it. Yes, you're talking about, like, important issues through the lens of what's going on in America, but it could very easily be happening in our own countries, too. And oh, yeah. in fact, it does. It and, like, in fact, parts kind of are, yeah. And, like, it's definitely, you know, reading these stories and talking about this and feeling like I do need an opinion as a writer and a critic and everything has made me personally want to get more politically active. I registered to vote for the first time this year. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, I registered to vote for the first... It's, it's in October it's coming up, the vote, so I'll either be very happy yes. or very sad around Halloween, we'll find <laughs> out. But, yeah, I actually I, I actually wanted to get out there and rock to vote, as P. Diddy says. <laughs> Vote or die, because if you don't vote, Puff Daddy will come and kill you. <laughs> that's what that meant, and you can't tell and, me that's and, not what that meant. And I believe him. Yeah, I believe him. You know, he can do whatever he wants. <laughs> uh, but yeah, good good question, Marvel Knight there. Uh, what else we got going on here? Some really uh, good questions this week. Very, very good ones. Uh, Krolnar, have either you or Matt checked out uh, Stefan Pansajic's uh, Sunstone comic? Uh, no, but I Googled it before we started. A lot of erotica in there. Lots of, I, lots of, lots of kink going on I, there. I follow him on Twitter, and every now and then he posts like stuff from it. I'm like, that's a comic I'm not really interested in. Like, it looks nice, but the, the <laughs> subject matter and doesn't really speak to me. <laughs> you personally. I mean, hey. A ain't gonna kink shame no one we all got our things and everything there but uh this th this sunstone seems like it's horny on main as the kids <laughs> say today uh here here's the thing i've just seen pictures of it i don't know what it's about i might like it like here's the thing i've read lots of shit where it's like oh geez joe are you are you one of those weird sex perverts no it's a good story <laughs> But you're also a weird sex pervert. <laughs> but I'm also a weird sex person too. So you know, it goes, it goes hands in hand is the whole thing. <laughs> Shit, I remember have to defend, uh, have remember having to defend liking Black Sad when that was a thing. Oh, like, really? oh, isn't that? It's like, oh, isn't that that furry book? I'm like, it's got anthropomorphic animals in it, but it's like a great noir throwback and everything. It's a mystery <laughs> book with animals that get their dicks and tits out all the time. But that's that's with noir. <laughs> that has nothing to do with that. <laughs> Okay, okay, I'm not jacking off to this, but someone out there is definitely jacking off to this. But it's not me. <laughs> okay, there was that one time. It was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> never again, never again. <laughs> yeah, I get lo lots of excellent questions. You guys are all learning so much about us tonight <laughs> through the questions. And, uh, okay, we got another one here from Theodore, another longtime fan there. I've seen yes. this guy forever. What non DC Marvel books are you reading at the moment? Ooh, well, I actually had one in like what we read this week, so I might stay for that. Ooh, ooh. ooh alrighty then. Uh, I had a trip recently, and I went back, and I was sure to revisit uh, a bunch of the stuff I had missed from Southern Bastards. Uh, I didn't know it was actually like done tentatively? Question mark. Like done, but when Aaron's not busy, he'll probably come back and write some more. Okay. 
But it definitely hit, like, a stopping point. It definitely hit, like, an end of uh, the beginning type thing. And, yeah, it was real good, real solid. Although I did notice a lot of similarities between how he ended this, like, uh, like I guess, tentative end for Southern Bastards and the end he ultimately wrote, wrote for Scalped. Mm-hmm. Like, literally, it's a three-way fight, Mexican standoff between three people whose lives have all intersected in similar ways, and there's a wild man with a weirdly unique weapon, a crime boss, the person he wronged in all these stories. And I'm like, did, did Jason Aaron, like, repeat himself without knowing he repeated himself? <laughs> like, yeah, the stories are very different and the characters are different, but, like, in the broadest strokes, if I was to describe this was to someone, they would think I was talking about the same book. <laughs> it does uh, sound familiar, yeah. Maybe he did just repeat it. Maybe it was just, like, busy. I'm writing War of the Realms or something. It's like, will anyone notice if I do this? <laughs> and it's even funnier, too, because the wild man with the unique weapon who shows up has way less of a reason to show up at the end of Southern Bastards than the wild man with a unique <laughs> weapon did in Scalped, because that character had been set up way longer. <laughs> oh, no. No one would notice except for Joel. Except for Joel, who read both religiously. <laughs> really liked it. And again, the ending was even to the point of like, it's the end for now. I'll probably come back and write more. I got to pick up Southern Bastards. I like read the, like the first, um, first like volume, volume but um, kind of stopped because I because I remember you saying like it's kind of finished but not. It's like not done, but it is. It's Schrodinger series. It's done but not done. Yeah, so I might go back now and like read up. So how many issues are there? Oh, like uh, like a little over twenty. Not that many. Yeah, actually. yeah, yeah. Cool. And they all read very quickly, like, through the course of, like, one car ride and one plane ride. I'm like, oh, shit, I'm done. Oh, nice. Because, like, you want to keep reading. It's, like, it's yeah. paced just like a really good HBO series where it's oh, like, okay, nice. well, let me let me watch a little of the next episode. Let me read the next episode. Oh, okay, I read that. Oh, well, <laughs> let me keep reading. That's cool. That's good. It's also a series about football, and I don't know anything about sports, but goddamn, the way Jason Aaron talks about football in that series, I'm like, yeah, man, football. <laughs> he's the Ken, he, Ken Burns of football. He gets you excited the, for football. <laughs> he's the Ken Burns. And he uses football as an allegory for other things. It's like people love football in the South above all else, and they're <laughs> like willing to excuse so many horrible things just for the sake of football. And I'm like, all right, I get that. Yeah, I've seen lots of like, not just series but like tv shows and movies that do that as well yeah like we're talking about football but we're really talking about all these other things it's a stand-in for all this other stuff and like how football is for many people like you know who don't have means as like a stepping stone to the next rung of society to like mm -hmm. be a somebody especially yep. in these small go nowhere southern towns it's either that or or crime, and so this is a book about crime and football together. And I'm like, ah, yes, I see what you're doing. This is this is good juxtaposition. Yes, they go hand in hand. Apparently, they go hand in hand according to this series. But uh, yeah, that's a new one I'm reading, or well, technically an old one that I finished, but still. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's all the questions, everyone. Thank you for submitting those the way you did. That uh, that filled a good uh, good chunk of the show. Yeah. Oh, great, great questions this week. Not the usually we get like double ups. Yes, I'm really happy to see people thinking outside the box. Not to not to totally kiss our fans' asses for cheap pots, but we have great, intelligent fans, don't we? Handsome, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean that, though, everyone. So with that, we can hop into what we read this week, and it was a pretty stacked week, all things considered. It was a pretty stacked week. Lots of Batman. Well yeah, see, I, I didn't even read as much Batman as you. I, I, I cut my Batman off a little bit there. <laughs> I didn't read Secret Files, but I know you did. I did, and well, let, let, let's start with that. So, like, let's. like, the cover is, like, half of the cover is, like, an advertisement for City of Bane saying it's big tie-in. It, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's not. It absolutely it isn't. Was. It, like, no way is it tied to City of Bane. So what it is is it's six stories about Batman stopping villains that's, right. that's all it is just six 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 stories with like riddler bane uh joker hugo strange characters who are in city of bane but these stories have nothing to do with that and they're all really great stories probably because of that yeah i was gonna say I, I never I never assumed that it was going to cross over because nothing's crossed over with no. Tom King's Batman because he doesn't play or, nice with others. Or clearly. when when it does like those wedding crossovers, he just doesn't give a shit about them. 
no, and just won't reference them. So again, all the more reason I didn't want to read it. And the biggest reason was, look, I'm not liking what Tom King is doing. <laughs> So I'm probably not going to like these, and if they're good, it's only going to piss me off more. <laughs> yeah, see, and with one change, he could have made this a tie-in, and the only change is you just changed the Batman to Flashpoint Batman, and it's a, it, oh. it, you, you could you could set it in, in this universe. But yeah, these were just like six stories of Batman like stopping the Joker with like a new suit that Alfred made him, and like Alfred didn't tell him, wanted him to figure it out on his own, be a bit of a detective um interesting we got uh hugo strange who continues to try and be batman by like hooking four people up to like saw like traps and like hooking (laughs) himself up to saw like traps to make sure he's the best batman and he just keeps running these tests until he becomes the best batman um a Hmm. really really great riddler story from marguerite scott where it basically explains why riddler always torments batman and is, is the uh-huh. great riddle at the end it's spoiled by the title of the story um but Uh-oh. but i didn't see that to begin with but like because the riddle is actually on the page and it tell oh. and it tells you at the start of the story can you figure out the riddle before hmm. the last page and i i did because it's it's quite obvious um R- writing good riddler stories is hard because it means yeah. you have to be good not only at storytelling but riddles and you have to stay uh stay one step ahead of the reader yeah but yeah the story is basically the riddler does what he does because he's alone and right. and tormenting batman gives like is like meeting with a friend basically what's the point of a riddle if you don't have anyone to tell it to yeah um what was the other stories there was the bane story uh which was kind of like the big crux of the book i i guess you could call that where it's like bane hunting someone down that you think through the whole story he's hunting this guy down who's a journalist who interviewed bane when he was a kid and you think oh oh he's protecting this guy no he's going to play he's going to kill this guy because this guy knows about his story and you can't have anyone knowing about his childhood where he came from why he does what he does and batman's one step behind him the whole way like following him and and you're following with batman and you that at the end you find out that he wasn't saving this guy he was going to kill him Hmm. yeah this is a pretty pretty cool batman uh bane story that's cool again it's just like i had too much batman this week i'm like look i pretty sure i feel safe in saying yeah. i can skip this one yeah <laughs> it sounds like i made the right choice yeah yeah you could you could have skipped it because there was no way to it was just good batman stories which apparently now are a rarity <laughs> are hard to find yeah uh we want to talk about x-men because we got the big powers of x this week yeah and we thought house of x was insane <laughs> Yeah, really. You thought you thought that was science fiction, huh? Ooh, you thought that was big idea, say John Hickman. Well, buckle the fuck up, Buttercup, because you ain't seen nothing. Yet. Four-prong timelines, bitch! Yeah, four-prong timelines showing the, like, the past, present, future, and far future of the X-Men. With, with a whole brand new calendar, the X-Men put together <laughs> X1, X100, X1000. Yeah, X10, X to the power yeah. of 10, stuff like that. Yeah. Which makes sense, because if they have their own language, they should have their own calendar too, shouldn't they? Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it was awesome. It was so cool. Yeah. Again, it, so. again, like House of X, you got those pages that tell you what's what, so you're never left feeling like you don't know who this person is or what what's happening mm-hmm. you're always yep. told what's happening so it's again another really cool first issue the big revelation we finally get answered who the hell are all these mutants that look like several mutants done to fusion dance from dragon ball and we found out that they are chimera class mutants yeah they're they're in the future where that's basically what they are they're they're two mutants fused together with like two of the uh was it like dna sort of so like the rasputin is actually colossus and magic like a version of them from the future yep which again that's it's like man that sounds like something mr sinister would do because it is actually in (laughs) the future turns out krakoa (laughs) falls to pieces and the mutants end up fighting another war against a sentinel human hybrid yeah the the human the machine human mutant war (laughs) yep which i'm like okay that sounds like an event i love who, who did someone say in my comment section where it's like man mutants just can't get away from dark future storylines can't they, they can't it always it always looks like it's gonna head in a good direction but then something happens magneto fucks something up or mr sinister throws a, a rabid wolverine in the mix or something <laughs> 
But that's kind of the genius thing about this, too, because Hickman realizes that, and he (laughs) makes it part of this theory. It's like, no, 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 man. X-Men history is cyclical, man. It all rises and falls together. They are in this great big wheel that they cannot see that they're in, but we as the reader can see it. Yeah, yeah. It's great. Very, very high concept. Very smart shit going on in that book. Yeah, it's very high concept, which is what I've always thought X-Men should be. Like it should be yeah. like like I said in for House of X, it should be like this huge, grand, epic story that spans like this. It spans decades and generations. There, there's some interesting mystery stuff going on there because we see in X Year One, Xavier who can still walk, meeting Moira McTaggart for the first time. Mm-hmm. But while McTaggart recognizes Xavier, Xavier does not recognize I, her. I didn't realize until after I put up my review that that was Moira McTaggart. Apparently. <laughs> I was yeah, like, I was like, who's they, this woman? Who, like, she she does seem very familiar. I was kind of like <laughs> Charles in that scene. Uh, Mc, McTaggart too, having some weird knowledge of the future because yeah. she talks about some tarot cards, which are clearly like representative of stuff that's going to be happening in like year one hundred, year one thousand, mm-hmm. which has led a lot of people to be like, oh, is that actually Moira McTaggart, or is that like some shapeshifter from the future come back to the past? Yeah, some like villain they're going to end up fighting. Who's tr- he's like playing with xavier or something we also get to see the fallout of mystique and her mission which yes it absolutely was a mission she was working for xavier and magneto and xavier's basically like look man uh paradise utopia that shit ain't free and all mutants gonna have to be putting in work in these streets if they want pays their way everyone pays their way Everyone, ass, cash, grass, government secrets, no one rides in Krakoa for free. <laughs> Which, man, that seems very evil on Xavier's part, does it not? Again, like, he, he's done nothing in this book so far that's made me think this is all, like, heroic. Like, some heroic dream of his. Like, I'm like, no, this is, this is, like, stuff a villain would do. And Eric, you and kind we- of did this stuff before. Like, why aren't you, is he messing with your mind? <laughs> Yeah, why are you so on board for all of this when you should know that these mistakes go, you know, lead you down a dark path? Uh, it's it's funny, too, now that we've seen Krakoa as this amazing super state that works, but we know full well from this other book. Actually, no, it doesn't work. It falls apart at some point. <laughs> when does it fall apart and why? Yep, yep. <laughs> And also, I love to know, too, that Orchis, these human supremacists who are like, ah, you know, screw you guys, we're going to take our super advanced alien robots and go to space where nothing bad can happen. Oh, no, the robots betrayed us and we sold out (laughs) our humanity. Who could have seen this coming? (laughs) Why did no one tell us? Yeah, we put too much faith in our killer robots. (laughs) Uh yeah, no, it's it's a great great first issue again with like all all those like really cool. I'm kind I'm kind of considering once this series is over, like because I've been I'm collecting all of those like cards in like a folder. I'm just doing a video about them. Yeah, because because there's Probably. like so much information in those pages that aren't actually on the pages of like the actual yeah. comic. This, between House of X and Powers of X the two meatiest single issues i think i've oh, read yeah. in a very long time oh yeah you're getting your money's worth oh without a doubt you want to talk about bang for your buck you want to talk about worth they're the most worth it and man i like that x-men is getting hot and excited again and people are like yeah. can i read this i've never read a comic before can i read this i haven't read x-men in a decade yeah it's cool seeing people getting excited for for x-men again good x-men and the answer is, yeah, yeah, you absolutely can read it, whether you've ha- been a laxed reader who haven't hasn't read in a decade, or if you just heard it, saw it, looked cool, and wanted to pick it up. Yeah, it's a com- for more all intents and purposes, it's a complete reboot. Yeah, basically, but it's a it's a complete reboot, but it also keeps everything. Yeah, it's an amazing hat trick that Jonathan Hickman has pulled off here to make something completely new reader friendly, yet something so entrenched in <laughs> lore. Yeah, it it's so so strange like it gives gives me hope that maybe other re- writers will see this and say like oh well, i can do like reboots and kind of keep some stuff like this as well and like make it good and not make it seem like you're just rebooting for the sake of sales like the nicest thing you can say about hickman's work is he makes it look easy oh he, he certainly does which you know it's not easy. You know he probably banged his head against a desk and had to scribble out a whiteboard a bunch to make it work. But now it just looks so effortless. Yeah, yeah. 
he makes it look so good. And, like, everyone is enjoying this. Like, I don't think I've seen anyone give a single bad review to this, because no. how could you? It just works on so many levels. Yeah, it does. It's so damn good. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, that's Powers of X. Good, good shit. It is. It's really damn good. Uh, what else did you want to talk about, Matt? We had a couple more things. Uh, we, had, we had more Batman. We had the second issue of Batman last night on Earth yes we did another big meaty comic here basically Ooh. scott snyder's grand unifying theory on everything he's written in batman yeah everything he's written on batman and justice league yeah all coming together in a big way uh man you, you gotta love the references in here i love fort waller and the unknown soldiers yep yeah all fighting like the the animal men who i guess part of like the green after the red like raped it and pillaged it and made swamp thing like this wandering aimlessly like mindless creature that's so cool <laughs> everything everything has gone to hell and i'm like ooh, i like that snyder is referencing swamp thing people forget he wrote swamp thing in the beginning of the new 52 his swamp thing work got so overshadowed by his batman work people forget he did good work on that book as well yeah yeah he was writing them both concurrently as well yes he was he certainly was yeah well we got stuff like like the the oceans boil during the atlantean war so nothing can live there the the the, the coasts have become like like calcified bone and stuff. Yeah. like oh really just like really cool law stuff that i really want to see more of i really want to see more of that sort of stuff he, he builds basically the old man logan universe yeah. here but for batman and like I don't even mean that insultingly. I mean that like, no, dude, it's, it's fucking old man Logan for, for Batman. Old man Logan's great and Batman is great. You put them together. Yeah, yeah. So really, really cool stuff. But yeah, Batman's drive this whole issue. Oh, no, we didn't even talk about the Speed, speed Force Storm, which is like a storm made oh, up yeah. of like Jay Garrick and w Wally West and Barry Allen all like fused together in a gruesome storm. Like That's so cool trapped forever suffering in the speed force that's a great moment too because it's like help us bruce help yeah. us and bruce is just like if i try and stop and help everybody i'm never gonna get there <laughs> you know it's really cool because the joker's narrating this book and he's like he he knows like batman wants to help him but knows he can't and it kills him that's so good that, that's completely right it's so good yeah yeah. And, you know, to see Batman, who normally would stop to help everyone, have to make that horrible choice yeah. in this, like, crazy Mad Max world. Yeah, yeah. And he, he can't stop because he has to go to the Fortress of Solitude because he needs he's going to seek out Superman. The Plains of Solitude, which yes. I love the idea that without Superman to watch over it, the crystal tech has just grown out yeah. of control like a garden in the Arctic. is just nothing but crystals now. Yeah, big towering crystals that he has to climb uh anyway he finds superman a bearded superman uh who takes him and he's he's built like a i don't know whether it's an exact replica or whether he actually moved half of kansas there um i'm assuming he just moved it with his super strength <laughs> yeah, yeah. honestly yeah he, he's moved the um kent farm there and we learn that lex Luthor is living in the kent farm and superman is actually a superman robot because superman yes. isn't alive anymore no and you know luthor felt really bad about what he did bringing about the end of the world with doom and everything and because of that he's been working overtime to try and save the world by recreating superman possibly recreating batman and several other fun projects i, I love the way he tried he, he goes about explaining recreating superman he's like okay i've got to op open a time portal at the moment krypton dest is destroyed and grab the the like kal-el's rocket and bring it here and we'll raise him to be superman and everything will be fine but like he doesn't take into account like the time vortex stuff so whenever it arrives it's always just like a cockpit full of ash because so <laughs> so yeah to put that in perspective lex luther has a million dead babies yeah. that he's been working off yeah, of yeah yeah he's been well it seems to imply he's been using their the dna from like their bones and stuff to make those robots yep and um pretty fucking horrifying he, huh? yeah yeah he's gotten like full insane because like as we learn his story is like like what's happening in justice league at the moment he made an offer to the world of doom and everything but he made an offer to superman first and it's like we'll debate each other we'll debate me in I, real life i i love that so much that lex <laughs> luther's final great gambit of evil his ultimate plan the one that actually ended up working and destroying the world was damn it superman debate me irl well, well, see and he does the, th the thing is like lex knew he wasn't going to win like he knew he's like i'm, I'm not gonna win and like this is this will be the thing that like maybe saves me 
So mm-hmm. he so he does it. He debates it. He's got like these sunstone crystals that are infected with kryptonite in the ground, and who, whoever the people who are all connected to, together by Jaro or Staro, yes. um, they vote on like justice or doom. And like the people, like in an it's inst- like American Idol. Yeah, the people in an instant vote for doom, and like Superman's killed by like these these spike things that will shoot up through him and i like lex is like oh, i've greatly misunderstood everything <laughs> and with superman dead it was the beginning of the end for everybody yeah uh, omega rose we actually get to see omega we haven't had, we haven't seen a lot of him no no we never we only heard about him in issue one and we only see him for a minute here he basically just looks like batman with a bunch of extra shit on his costume yeah when he he goes to kill alfred which is which is sad Yes, very much so, because poor Alfred there. Also, we get Master Blaster, Bane, and Scarecrow. Yeah, yeah, that was cool. That was cool. That's really horrifying. Master Blaster, Scarecrow runs, bot attack. <laughs> <laughs> he crawls around on like his like needle hands and stuff. It's... Yeah, it's like taking the Arkham shit to the next level. What if he had creepy needle hands that he walked around on? Yeah, that that was really cool. He infects like the Superman, so it's up to Wonder Woman to like kill the superman robot and save him lex has that last little redeeming thing where he like teleports them away and i, I like what wonder woman says to him it's like i'll never forgive you for what you did but i'll tell them what you did here i, I wonder if that gives us a little taste of how uh snyder might end his justice league story the way that he feels in the back of his head that lex is still slightly redeemable yeah well i i, I imagine he will be i somehow redeem he'll see the light or something i don't know martian manhunter wants to redeem him yeah 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 well they've got a history now Mm -hmm. they then take a trip through the specter's cloak and i love the specter's cloak is giant because that's a power he has yeah he would have like shown up on earth in like his giant form to like invoke fear or something something would the people would just like beat the fuck out of him or something because it says when the when when the war on earth spread to like heaven and hell Mm-hmm. yeah they that's how bad it got they they travel the river sticks and love that as a theory because of course it's like yeah obviously you travel the river sticks with wonder woman naturally she knows how to get and there i i like the, the the whole thing about it where it's like where when you travel it you hear the people that you feel you're responsible for so like wonder woman hears her sisters and sees them mm-hmm. whereas bruce sees every hero in the dc universe everyone oh, because batman feels responsible for everyone yeah, including alfred who he didn't know had died and ah oh, that's the saddest one and uh, wonder woman's like no keep your hands and legs inside the boat at all time or you'll be lost but you know he really wants to jump out yeah and apparently going through the river sticks leads them to gotham or what is gotham now yeah, now that omega runs the place yeah so and they they end up running into the court of owls which might be run by omega like be part of his team or something we're not too sure they just like kind of ambush them they just kind of roam the streets and naturally hey wouldn't it surprise you to know that the guy leading the court of owls now is dick grayson which yeah. of course makes all the sense in the world because that's what originally what he was supposed to be in the court of owls story he was the gray son of gotham preordained to become a talent yeah, and apparently that's also what's going to be happening in his nightwing book recently yeah, well, because they're bringing William Cobb back, his, like, great, great, great uncle. And yeah. uh, I, I think they're going to say that he's going to be the one to actually uh, knock the shit out of him and make him Dick Grayson again. Oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah, thank fuck. L- send a Talon to do the job, luckily. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, we got one more issue left, and I, I'm intrigued to find out. Like, I'm, I was really surprised we didn't find out who Omega was in this issue. Like, we didn't really get yeah, any, like- any hints at who he is either no only what we already knew and that is that he he well i mean we assume it's he it could just as easily be a she is connected to the batman family somehow yeah i i'm just gonna say it's damien damien it's his batman 666 bat batman yeah or or it's another batman because we're also seeing weird like dreams that also Mm -hmm. maybe aren't dreams because it's batman continuing to follow the case that killed him which makes me think wait did the original batman die and then they woke up this clone batman to try and solve the case but something happened along the way yeah or like that that is the original batman or something or this bruce is the original batman and he's fighting the clone or something yeah 
They also offhandedly mentioned Joe Chill's son, which is mm -hmm. funny because he's actually had several children canonically. So wouldn't that be an interesting thing where it's like, ha ha ha, you know, your final uh, villain here at the end of the world is me, the son of Joe Chill. Yeah, that, that, that'd be interesting. I, I'm intrigued. It's the, uh, what is there? It's Harley. <laughs> oh, please don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> Harley was behind it's everything. Bane. Nah. It's Bane. Oh, it was me. Harley was a bad girl. <laughs> No, it's uh, it's Harvey Bullock, is what it is. It's <laughs> all your fault, Batman. It's me, Harvey Bullock. I did it. No joke though, but I'd love it to be like like Jim Gordon or something. That would make sense because clearly Snyder set up that Gordon loves Gotham City as much as Batman, and if Batman ever went away, he would be the next logical choice to become the next mm -hmm. in line should Dick Grayson or the others not want to do it. And to have him be Omega and turn Gotham into a literal police state would kind of be a fun callback to his time as Batman. That would, that would be pretty cool. And also, what a hard villain for him to fight, because like, next to Alfred, Gordon is like a father figure to him. Yeah. Damn it, Matt, if we're, if we're right. <laughs> we've been right before we've been right before it's true we've called shit and wish we hadn't sometimes <laughs> do uh do, do we want to keep this bat train rolling do we just want to talk about batman who laughs seven next yeah so the finale for that book it ended really cool in a really cool way it did it did. I don't know if it 100% stuck the landing as much as I love Snyder's work, and I think even he'll admit this too. He builds these amazing mouse traps for his hero. He builds these amazing mm -hmm. scenarios that it's like, okay, how do they get out of it? Um, Batman? Okay. Because <laughs> he's Batman. But, but the thing is, he's... he does it in a way where you're like, oh, that that's pretty cool. Unlike like, other batman writers at the time at the moment who are just like he does it because he's batman i don't need to tell you why he here at least like i think snyder is very self-aware now of the fact that people think his endings aren't that strong he's like okay fine i will write an open-ended ending now where you can make up your own mind either you believe alfred and he was able to defeat the batman who laughs and do the right thing and yada 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 because he is secretly the best and you know he can do it all and you know mm -hmm. he's a man such a man <laughs> Or that this is actually a trick being played by the Joker and the poison that he sucked up in issue one was actually time delayed because Joker was secretly fighting both Batman and the Batman who laughed simultaneously. Yeah, I, I like that. And as well as like that gives also something for Joshua Williamson to maybe explore in Batman and Superman because this book leads into that. Yes, naturally, absolutely. Uh, it, my favorite moment by far is when, you know, uh, Batman Who Laughs thinks he's fully defeated Batman, and he starts chasing the little kid Bruce who got uh, dragged through the portal. And it's a total horror movie moment. And Alfred comes to the defense of the kid, shooting Batman Who Laughs over and over <laughs> again with a shotgun. And this visual poetry is so amazing. Alfred standing between this young, innocent Bruce who hasn't even lost his parents yet, and this dark, twisted horror horror batman monster and i'm yeah. like this this is the life they live right i'm still trying to protect this kid all these years later from the worst thing he could possibly become yeah and he also tells the kid like don't go to go don't go to see zorro when when your parents want to it is kind of like what happened in in last night on earth because he says that in there as well like yeah, when, when 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 uh scarecrow drugs him it is great yeah don't don't go to the theater and he's like i feel like i saved one bruce and it's like oh alfred you saved more than one bruce and you know that <laughs> I, I i like that um like the batman who last like keeps gl gloating over bruce how bruce is like the worst batman out of all of them mm -hmm. and and like bruce like agrees with that but like that's like what he uses as his strength because he's the worst batman like that's a, he doesn't see that as like a a failure or anything it's it, that's like his strength to be better and everything and again this is it's like two different writers writing that whereas we, we got like scott Snyder who writes that as like a good thing yeah it was like a character building moment whereas the whereas the other writer writes it just because he hates batman <laughs> It's, it's very much like, yeah, there's Batman who are happier than me, war more well-adjusted mm -hmm. than me, closer to ending crime in Gotham than me, mm -hmm. but you know what? I'm everything my universe needs 
for better or worse. And also, if I am the worst Batman in the multiverse, then what does that make you once I beat you? A joke. That's what that makes yeah, you. Beats him to death with a Martha Wayne headstone. That's so cool. Which you know that had to be like I wrote Martha. Martha now. Who's Martha now? <laughs> And then ultimately the Joker ends up kind of being a hero too because it's yeah. like, oh no, Batman's all high on dark multiverse meth. Who's going to stop him? Hey, hey, it's me, the Joker. <laughs> Pff, we're, we're even now for killing me earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and as well, like the, the book ends with like Bruce positing the fact that like the, the dark, uh, the Batman who laughs was right because he's every, he's like the ideologies of Batman and Joker and they both right in a way and ha- anything to laugh anything to win yeah yeah and it's, it's really great and, and as well as like gives us a timeline of when this series takes place it's all before justice league starts um because yeah because the the batman who laughs gets locked away um but yeah it was a really cool book it ended on a really cool cliffhanger with the first member of the secret six being revealed to be gordon to where i'm like all right okay i see what you're doing here now we'll take their closest friends and ideological (laughs) allies and we'll twist them to the dark side because as we've seen throughout this series gordon is very capable is he not Mm -hmm. and like he he defeated the grim knight in that other earth when no one else did Mm -hmm. because he loves gotham that much and when push comes to shove he'll put on a batman beyond suit and he'll fight people and he'll do whatever and oh wow now imagine turning that, inverting that, and making that evil. Yeah. What happened to the the Grim Knight in this? Like, did James kill him? Because like, it, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, because it was kind of left over open end. Because he's like stabbing the fuck out of him, but then Jim stops him. So I don't know whether he's alive or dead. Or, I guess maybe it's like one of those things. Ah, if people like him, he's alive. And people did like him, yeah. so we might actually bring him back yeah. somewhere. I, I I did like it there where you really didn't know whose side James Jr. was going to yeah. be on. Whereas, like, well, I love my dad, but I'm also off my meds and fucking crazy right now. <laughs> and the Grim Knight's making some good points saying that I can murder and murder. Okay, he keeps talking. He keeps talking. Less talking, more murder. <laughs> To where it's like, see, his problem was he didn't let him murder. He just kept talking about murder <laughs> till his murder boner was too much to contain. <laughs> yeah, he had it longer than four hours. So he had to go see a yeah, do- Mr. Dr. Murder. <laughs> Dr. Murder. And the fact that, like, Jim doesn't totally disown his son. And I yeah. wonder the fact that he doesn't totally disown his son at the end of the story. Is that real Gordon talking mm-hmm. or is that inverted Gordon yeah. talking? Where, like, normal Gordon wouldn't have forgiven his son, but inverted like evil gordon is a little bit more forgiving yeah is he gonna like start like molding his son back into like a killer yeah or would it be interesting too if james gordon jr's like okay well maybe i need to put on a costume now to fight my father yeah or like yeah it becomes like the inverse where it's like he helped me so now i've got to help him with his problems It'd be a hell of a thing to have a hero who was also a serial killer once upon a time, but to have him be like, no, 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 I'm better now because I'm on anti-psychotic medication. I was mentally ill before. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason I offended and did these things. So long as I take these pills, I'm a normal contributing member of society and on parole. You could tell a really smart adult story about that and being like, look, can you redeem a guy who was a serial killer? It it would be very cool. And it'd also be a I'd, I'd want scott snyder to tackle it since he's kind of posited those things but yeah it'd, it'd be re- like a really cool book and maybe something for the black label you know it will it really would be it's a shame the crow is already taken by a famous <laughs> comic character because they say no you'll be better than a robin you'll be a crow a bird of death <laughs> just call him the bird of death <laughs> the bird of death can i be raven raven is also taken fuck <laughs> Uh, Black Canet, nope, that's also... T- Shit, are all the cool bird names taken in this world? Yeah. I'll be the Tal... No, god damn it. <laughs> Just stick, like, murder in front of all of those, like, murder crow. There you go. I am the murder crow. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it's true. All the good bird names are taken. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all the bat-related names are taken, too, now that I stop they, and think they about are, it. They are, yeah. They've all been trademarked. For sure. But yeah, good, solid book, and promising more good stuff coming down the line because this is just a jumping off point now for something else oh yeah i'm really looking forward to that batman superman book i saw some of the art for it the other day from david marquez and oh my god it looks so good damn good it it does look good he's a really talented artist 
what else did you want to talk about? Um, well, I, I mentioned I had like a uh, indie book uh, this week, and uh, mm-hmm. I had Colin Bunn's new book, Knights Temporal. Oh, interesting. We like Colin Bunn on this yes. show. Do do tell. Uh, so it's about a uh, a crusader knight named Auguste de, Riv- de River. It's good. It's, cool. it's that weird like like French name where they have the E's on the end of like a normal word. Mm. Yeah. Um and de, de, de <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh and he's he's like hunting sorcerers and stuff and like you do. Yeah, this first issue is really interesting because it, it gives you about as much information as the main character has, which is nothing. Um <laughs> so yeah, he's hunting this this wizard who's like like killed a bunch of his crusader friends and somehow that leads to him arriving in present day and uh, we we cut to him in present day and he's hunting like monsters through los angeles and he's got this woman with him named jane who may or may not be like the 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 evil sorceress's like like woman like his her partner or something we're we're not really too sure because like the stuff she does in the book is really sinister and and like she's like manipulating him and everything and he's like hunting this 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 monster down and just so happens that this guy sees them and this guy when he was a child 50 years ago was saved by august um oh in in like the 70s and right. and, he, and august has no memory about it or anything and we find out that like this woman's been like manipulating him through through the ages and like oh, kind of like shit. whenever he gets really close to finding the the sorcerer she kind of like hits the reset button like, oh so it's like a highlander type kind of yeah yeah it's really interesting like he doesn't know any of this we learn this by the end of this issue so he's been like manipulated by this woman uh, who just yeah keeps resetting his timeline basically in different hmm. eras i'm uh, i'm looking at the artwork right now yeah it looks cool it, it's really cool it's it's a cool first issue he's also got like this I'm not explain what it is it's like a demon sword thing that like i like that. like he, he he had to drop his, his his crusader sword for this demon sword thing that like just comes when it wants to huh yeah it's, it's a very very intriguing first issue to like give us readers about the same amount of information as the main character has in this whereas like we're kind of got amnesia like he does I'm I'm reminded of uh, Cullen Bunn's Western series he did, Six Gun, mm-hmm. which is the book that actually got me really interested in his work in the first mm-hmm. place. That sounds like something I might have to look into, Matt, because I really liked what he did with Cowboys. Now I want to see what he does with Cool Crusader Knights. Yeah, it looks really cool. And again, like you said, it's like Highlander. You had me at that. You had me at, like, <laughs> at a Cool Crusader Knight in modern. Like, wait, wait, wait. That sounds like some shit I drew in my notebook in 10th grade. <laughs> yeah, a Cool Crusader in, like, modern times, but then also maybe time travel. <laughs> time travel? Question mark? <laughs> we'll see. All right, that sounds pretty dope. Yeah. Uh, what else do I have this week? Uh, ooh, I had the new Captain America number 12. I literally read this this morning before I went to work. Oh. Well, there you go. So we're all caught up on this one. Some big shit actually went down in this yeah, one. Yeah. So yeah, Captain America just broke out of Baron Strucker's state-sponsored prison <laughs> in the previous issue. And even after him saying to uh, Sharon that he's like, look, I'm only going to go to jail so I can try and fight this frame up from the inside because you know I still believe in the system and the American justice system. And we're going to show them all that I'm innocent. Oh, no, wait, actually, uh, Alexa Lucan and the Power Elite totally have their fingers in everything. And oh, they're slandering me on Fox News. And oh, wait, this game is so totally rigged. <laughs> Fuck. Oh, okay okay sharon we'll do it your way yeah, this, everything is fucked let's 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 be like terrorists basically <laughs> yeah let's let's underground captain america yeah. which you know what here's the thing about captain america he does this shit like every decade yeah yeah every couple of months <laughs> basically yeah when when he became nomad when he became the captain when the government took his shit away when he didn't uh take the mantle away from bucky when he came back from the dead and basically the idea is, is like, look, Captain America is tarnished and has been tarnished since the Secret Empire, and my villains will keep coming at me this way, mm-hmm. 
so long as I'm still wearing the stars and stripes. So I got to stop being Captain America and I got to start being Steve Rogers again. Only Steve Rogers can save Captain America. Yeah. And I, I like, like what you said, like how he always keeps going back to being like different roles, like captains and they make like make reference to that where he goes to like the warehouse to get like the extra costumes and stuff. And they've got like, I love these, the are, these are all of the ones that I've been every time the government has failed me. <laughs> And yeah I, I, I like you know, on the rule they had like that that shitty like 70s tv one where he rode the motorbike I, I was like oh can he just like grab that and we get that hero shot at the end with him in that costume <laughs> that would be really good uh, they keep mentioning a thing here time and time again and i think it's a really good evolution for the character of captain america i would say it's as meaningful as when superman's you know uh went from you know truth justice on the american way to well truth justice and the way of the world where captain america's like look i am captain america i love my country i drape myself in the flag of america but there are some ideals i hold higher than that i am uh, honoring the dream mm -hmm. which obviously he's talking about the american dream but it's the dream of everyone, and I like that there. Where it's like, okay, cool. So you know, in a day and age where where the Captain America movies are huge hits in like China and overseas and everything, I like we're like maybe we should update his uh, his ethos a little bit to make it the dream. You know, we're all dedicated to the dream. Yeah, yeah. It's it's just so so damn good what what Tanahasi Coast has been doing with this series. It's like so different compared to like like Mark Wade stuff before this and uh, all, all the stuff. That, even spencer yeah he, nick spencer's all that sort of stuff like it's just so different but and it like builds on all of that stuff like all that stuff that was it, left over from that absolutely and i think some people are giving it the credit it deserves no. because it's a very different type of comic it is talky it is worry it is a slow burn you can tell Coates was a journalist before he was a writer of comic mm -hmm. books and uh it's I, I i've said it a million times before and i'll keep saying it it's very west wing mm -hmm. it's yep. superhero by way of uh alan sorkin yeah people walking down corridors talking stuff like that and it, it's great i love that sort of stuff in this book same and you don't get that in any other no. comic right now and if any book is going to be a talky taught political thriller why not captain america exactly I think it fits really well, and they even start putting in some other, like, uh, little wrenches into the scheme there. It's like, okay, so Cap is going solo again, you know, he's going without government aid, he's doing his own thing. Well, what about Nick Fury? Well, okay, well, Nick Fury, there's S.H.I.E.L.D. isn't a thing anymore, but he's still being sublet by the government, and he still has to bring Cap in, because he did technically break out of jail, and they still do think he killed General Ross. Mm -hmm. Yep. But you can tell he's getting stonewalled by people like Bucky, who are like, well, fuck you, we're not helping you. <laughs> and Bucky's also doing his own thing. Him and the Dryad, they've kidnapped Strucker and a bunch of the other Hydra guys, and they're, like, probing their brains. And it's very clear that this is, like, some darker shit, where they're like, okay, maybe we I, won't tell Cap we're doing I, this. I, I love the idea of the Dryad, who's, like, this one that they, like, call in when they need, like, the wet work done. Yeah, I, I where it's it. like, look, you know... It is good, and, you know, the whole question has been, like, well, who is the Dryad, you know? Who is this mysterious woman? Is, is it a mantle that someone takes? Because they imply that the Daughters of Liberty are actually older than America, mm -hmm. even, in this issue. Which I'm like, ooh, that's a fascinating concept, that the Sons of Liberty got the name from them mm -hmm. and not the other way around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then, eventually, it's revealed that, oh, yeah, the Dryad is Peggy Carter. Mm, yeah some somehow back from the dead and somehow younger and sporting a nose ring yeah we we, we don't, don't know how I, I i'm very intrigued to find out i wonder if this was like a, a thing again you can you can tie this back into secret empire by making her like mm. oh this is something that happened when the cosmic cube like split steve mm. or like combined steve or some like that she was part of him or something because she's so intrinsically tied to him. Yeah, that would be a good way if they wanted to write that. I just think it's cool now because maybe someone can finally write something about like, hey, it's me, Peggy, the woman you love and was together with during World War II. Why are you fucking my niece, Steve? <laughs> yeah, why are you kissing her, Steve? What, what, what's going uh, on? I need to go back in the ice. <laughs> yeah, there's a plane that needs to be crashed. I need to go. Yeah. <laughs> I need to go now. My people need me. No, no you see peggy that was captain america who did that i i'm not captain america i'm Steve yeah, that was an insane now. clone 
Yeah. No, no, no. You see, that was the guy who calls himself the Grand Dictator. That was that was one of the other Captain <laughs> Americas. That, that, that was John Walker. Go talk to him, U.S. agent. Go beat him up. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it'll be interesting to see what happens. And they can't even play with the um, the the evil Steve, the Supreme Commander Steve anymore because he, he's fucking dead. Seemingly, he got burnt up, but yeah, seemingly he might be dead. I do love the idea, though, where it's like, no, 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 you see, we kill him so he can't tell his side of the story, and he can't take credit for any of the evil shit we're framing real Steve for. Yeah. So I think it would be a missed opportunity that they burnt up his face and made him look like the Red Skull, and that the Red Skull isn't going to want to jump into a Captain America body, because technically his body was already a Captain America body. I have to say, that's probably what they're going to do. Like that, that someone brought that up in my comment section about like weird continuity they don't bring up anymore. It's like, well, technically the body Red Skull has been running around and is a body he actually stole from Captain America. And I'm like, that's right, that is. Mm -hmm. That's some like really early like World War II story weirdness. <laughs> that's technically still canon because no one ever thought to uncanonize. <laughs> no it. one, no one knows about it. No one that's working at Marvel knows about it at the moment because it was written long before they were even there. <laughs> Or if they do, it's like, don't d don't even broach the subject, because that opens up like a million cans of a million yeah. Akira Kishi Akira Yoshida told him not to. Yeah, don't do not do it. <laughs> and, and then he said, more samurai books, please. <laughs> he does that. But yeah, Captain America, very interesting title as it stands right now. Yeah, it was, it was so damn cool. Mm -hmm. very very different not like anything on the shelf right now i wonder if what's going to happen in this book is going to catch up to avengers and invaders and if he will just be agent steve there i hope so because the timeline of this book is interesting because it's one of the only books that doesn't have to do tie-ins yeah yeah it's, and for all intents it's like secret it follows on from secret empire but then like the stuff with like does that mean the stuff in Avengers is the future for this book? Is it the past? Is it, is, is very strange. But yeah, I'm glad that's kind of self-contained in a way. It's creativity over continuity, but it actually makes sense. Yeah, it's good creativity over continuity. To be like, look, I have this story with a beginning, middle, and end, and I want to tell it monthly, but the thing is, is that if it fits in continuity, <laughs> it won't make sense. No. <laughs> And also, too, you know, it's like Steve literally says, look, I'm putting the costume down now, but I'm going to get it back later. Yeah, it's going to be there. So just, you know, fill it in wherever you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, that was the one I had. I had one more this week. I actually know two more, technically. All right. What did you have? Uh, ooh, I had uh, Justice League Dark Annual. I haven't read this yet. I'm going to start reading it with this issue. Ooh, then I almost don't want to spoil. Okay. Yeah, you know, just, do I'm just, not... go. just do it. Just do it. Okay. I've okay, like so it's a flick, swamp. I've like flicked through it, so. Okay, it's a swamp thing centric story. Mm -hmm. Which is really cool because James Tynan clearly has a lot of love and respect for old Vertigo titles, and it's written exactly like an old Vertigo book. Oh nice. Literally. The idea is is that okay, magic is so fucked up in the universe now, the Parliament of Trees got destroyed. Mm -hmm. And because it got destroyed, the next time Swamp Thing dies, he's dead for good. He's not Ooh. getting magically resurrected. He's got one heart left. He's got one heart left, and but even just because the Parliament of Trees is gone, the Green still creates like a new Parliament to run shit. But it's called the Parliament of Flowers. Okay. The flowers have now overtaken the trees, and the it's time. Constantine tells him that it's time that the flowers will choose a new champion, Ooh. and and their champion is a guy called the King of Petals. <laughs> And the idea being is that the guy they pick is a dude named Dr. Oleander, and his life story is very similar to that of Alec Holland. He's a botanist who was trying to grow, uh, like, super crops that could be grown in any climate and that, you know, would put an end to food shortage and war and everything. Mm -hmm. And it was him and his wife. They moved out to the country to do this with their young kid who took ill and died. Okay. <laughs> and this, like, drove a massive wedge between them and between their relationship and they ended up breaking up and he threw himself into his work completely and because he threw himself into his work completely there was a fire he died and he came back as the new champion of the green the king of petals oh wow <laughs> yeah pretty pretty it only gets darker is the thing so swamp thing comes to him, it's like look man i've literally been exactly where you are <laughs> right now 
you need to know Dr. Oleander is dead. You're not him anymore. That's just the green fucking with you is the thing. They do that, making you think you're human when you're not. And the sooner you come to terms with that, the better you'll be. Yeah, yeah. That's that's cool that they, they went that route and they didn't, like, play with it a lot longer. Like the whole Alec Holm swamp. swamp thing sort of thing. Exactly. And, you know, Swamp Thing is trying to be the angel on his shoulder because on the other side... We have the devil on his shoulder, the Floronic man who shows up <laughs> and says, look, man, don't listen to Swamp Thing. He's a punk ass bitch. Uh, you should you should do whatever the fuck you want. I was champion of the green once and I just rock and rolled all night and partied every day. What do you want to do? And he's like, well, my wife is really sad that our kid is dead. It's like, we'll make a new kid out of plants. He can do that. And he's like, really? So he makes a new kid out of plants. And then he makes more kids out of plants to give to his wife. And his wife is, like, really happy because she has a family. Until we eventually realize that uh, the fire that killed him wasn't an accident. It was a suicide. Oh, no. (laughs) He killed himself. And furthermore, him and his wife were doing research saying that plants have a sort of, like, DNA memory. Mm -hmm. And so because he killed himself, he passed that depression and suicidal response down to these new plant children he's Jesus. created for his wife, who also try to kill themselves. Oh, jeez. And Swamp Thing steps in. It's like, what is that? I told you, don't do this. <laughs> oh, my God, this is so fucked. And it's all Swamp Thing can do to, like, try and save this lady. And once the guy realizes what he's done, he's like, this is the worst. This is fucking horrible. What, what do I do, Floronic man? And he's like, well, how about you go to sleep? You can do that, right? You're an elemental. Just just go into the earth and stay there as long as you want. And then he bites him like a vampire, drinks his blood, and goes, Ah, now I'm back in the green now. <laughs> I'm like a green vampire. And then Cersei the Sorceress shows up, and it's like, Yo, Florotic Man, that was fucking dope how you tricked that guy. <laughs> and ruined his life and stole your green powers back how would you like to join my injustice league dark we can go fuck over swamp thing and he's like fucking hey oh, that's awesome it was a really good story nice i'm looking forward to that it's really solid and again I-, I rushed through it but man talk about a good like messed up horror story i hope if they ever do anything more with swamp thing which i doubt now that his show is canceled i hope james tynan could write it yeah yeah that oh, that'd be so good like another swamp thing book it's even better because Swamp Thing looks like Alan Moore now. So to see Alan Moore, Swamp Thing, show up to another champion of the green and be like, it's all fucking bullshit. It's just all stupid anyway. Don't don't even get involved in comics. I, I mean, being a superhero. I mean, the green. Just don't even. <laughs> Before moving back to his cave. But, but literally moving back to his cave. I'm like, wow, he's really, con- he just is his creator now. <laughs> Just all bullshit anyway. Uh, Being champion of the green, fuck that. Oh, uh, that's great. I, I I had one more book as well. I had um Avengers mm. issue twenty two. As did I. Yeah. So this is the, the the exorcism of Robbie Reyes. Cool title. Yeah, and um, yeah. So Robbie is getting kind of sick of the car. The car is like talking to him now after that whole debacle with the vampires. But it's not not his not his uncle Eli's voice. They they address that in this issue. They finally do. It's like Jason. I knew they were going to do that. (laughs) He's like, stop yelling at me, Ghost Rider fans. I didn't know that. I I mean, I meant to know. It was a different, but you just didn't know it was a different (laughs) voice because only Robbie knew it was different. But now they know it's different. See, look, I know what's up. (laughs) I think he meant to do that the whole way because comic fans are so impatient. They couldn't wait for the Mm -hmm. story to unfold. I think there's been stuff with Robbie that he just didn't read it, or he did. He didn't think Robbie would have as many fans as he did. I think he thought he was doing the character of Robbie a favor, and that people weren't going to care. Um, but that's just me. Yeah. So he he goes to the Avengers with wanting to get rid of the car. He, he doesn't want it anymore. He doesn't want like the the spirit of vengeance or whatever it infects him in, in, yeah. with the car. So. Uh, the Avengers are like cool. We'll like run some tests. We'll call in expert Damon Hellstrom to to sort this out. Hey, what are the odds of that Damon Hellstrom and the Robbie Reyes Ghost Rider together? It's almost like you two are getting shows or something. Yeah, so. and then now Blade is really popular in this in this book as well. Um, yeah, so they also why is Damon bald now? He never used to be bald. They hey, made him a bald guy out of the blue now. Dabbling in the dark arts has some unseen advantages and disadvantages on your hair follicles. So you know, 
Well, he, here's the thing, actually. When Hellstorm was first created, his hair was made of fire. <laughs> but then, obviously, Ghost Rider became way more popular as a character whose hair is also fire. <laughs> he, he put his so hair. I wonder if this is a thing where they're like, look, well, we can't have two characters whose heads are fire. <laughs> and then when Carol goes binary, her hair's kind of on fire. And <laughs> Ooh, we got a new team we can make. <laughs> the fire hairs. <laughs> I do like uh, Carol's relationship with Robbie in this series, how she's kind of like a big sister. It's probably the most likable but Carol's has been in a long like time a in the book. big sister, mother sort of figure to him. Yeah, I, I like it as well. But yeah, he, he comes in, he's like, right, I'm going to like exercise the demon de- uh, blade. He's uh, an arch weapon of of, uh, of hell. If something goes wrong, fucking cap our asses, you know. <laughs> Which blade is just so on board that he doesn't have like a no, I couldn't possibly. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. Hell weapons. <laughs> Yeah, I am so down for all of this. <laughs> um, I, I like the part as well where where he's about to start the spell and he's like, Captain America, fuck off, you're too good of heart. Fuck off. You're too pure. It's like, anyone whose heart has not been touched by the fires of hell can leave now. Steve, we're, we're yeah, literally just, all looking yeah, at you Yeah, just right. stares at Steve. <laughs> <laughs> but because Cap is so good, he's like, no, I'm going to help my teammate because I'm a good friend and everything. I'm like, oh, that's a nice moment for I, him. I like, the, I like the part where his hand, he, he's like, he helped him. And so his hands got like burnt and like, it's like you need to douse mm. them in holy water because like, your hands will become like possessed. I'm like, oh, I really wish we got like like an Evil Dead situation where Cap's hands are possessed hands. and he's choking himself and Iron Man or something. And- <laughs> it's not me, it's the demon hands. <laughs> See, there's like a total sequel story you can do right there. And he, he cuts his hands off and replaces them with shields. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. No one would have a problem with that. <laughs> but yeah, they, they end up like sending Robbie to hell um because like the the ghost rider activates and and johnny blaze is there because johnny blaze is now king of hell and it's weird because this book like damon says he tries to contact them and no one's heard from johnny in weeks i'm like what the, what yeah. the fuck is the timeline of this book no one's heard johnny in like years <laughs> He's, he's only been king of hell for weeks, and also at the end of that damnation story where he became king of hell, Mephisto also got locked up in his Vegas tower, which got referenced in the last issue of this, even though the champions had Mephisto too and didn't reference the tower, but now the tower is getting referenced again. <laughs> they also mentioned Danny Ketch, but he's like a drunkard now. <laughs> Which is interesting because we know he's going to be getting one shots in miniseries soon, which is so weird because Robbie's the one getting the show, but Danny Ketch is getting like a new push. Yeah, maybe they want to bring back, bring he's the drunk rider or something. You can't like stand the bike up properly or something. I got it. Oh, I got the fun. bike. Yeah. Uh, I'm fine. All he has is his ranks, <laughs> officer. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. <laughs> <laughs> Now that's a fun story. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he, he gets sent to hell, and uh, Johnny says, "Like, I'll, I'll get rid of like the 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 demon in in your car, Ghost Rider, Spirit of Vengeance, whatever it is. If you race me, you gotta you race. Right? Race I like for that. pink yeah. slips. We, yeah, we we Ghost Riders, we got a way of doing things here. You gotta race for it." <laughs> We use that to settle everything. And also, Cosmic Ghost Rider is going to be in this story, too, because he died in Guardians and went to hell, so he is also there. (laughs) Jeez. (laughs) All the Ghost Riders. And somewhere, Alejandra is like, hey, can I be here, too? I was also a Ghost Rider. And Carter Slade is like, I was the first Ghost Rider. Yeah, and are we going to get, like, the old Ghost Rider? Because as well in this, it's referencing the um, Avengers 1 million BC team, because we get, Mm. like, Iron Man who finds... Or Okoyo finds like an Iron Man helmet that like dates back to the Stone Age in, in like a tunnel, and it's like is, is, was Iron Man part of that? Was he a villain there? Would is is, is Steve is uh, Tony going to go back in time? That's what I thought they seek to imply. Where it's like okay, at some point the Avengers and Avengers BC naturally have to meet, and it looks like Iron Man is going to be involved oh, in some yeah. time travel I'm, shenanigans. I'm looking forward to that yeah i'm down for that too yeah avengers continues to be fun yeah it's a really great book i like that robbie is getting some spotlight here before his tv show which again yeah. makes me think that he's gonna learn to eventually you know keep the ghost rider identity because it's not like they're gonna depower him right before he's getting a goddamn TV yeah they'll show. do something where it like it cleanses the ghost rider entity and makes it like an actual spirit of vengeance 
Yeah, you've got control. I do love the joke in here where the Avengers are like, actually, when you break it down, we don't know that much about Ghost Riders and the spirit of vengeance. Sometimes it's like an angel thing. Sometimes it's like a dude who makes a deal with the devil. It's like writers kept inventing shit. You know what would be really cool? It's probably kind of a stupid idea that like, because obviously Robbie was gunned down by a drug cartel. So mm. wouldn't it be cool if like the spirit of vengeance he ends up getting is his own soul? Hmm. Interesting. Like they make it that because mm. he was gunned down, he wants vengeance. That'd be that'd be pretty cool. So he's technically himself in a way. Well, I mean, he already he, he already avenged those guys though in his solo. Yeah, series, true, though. true. But maybe Jason Aaron didn't read that. <laughs> I don't think he did, which is a shame because that like Felipe Smith run is really it was, really, it was good. really good. I, which I, I wish that one made it, but it just didn't. But then again, that's not really his fault. That's Ghost Rider's fault in general. No Ghost Rider yeah. book makes it that long. Nah, no one really cares. Hell, the catch run ran for like 60-odd issues or something, and no one really ever references it anymore. And he's not even the main Ghost Rider anymore, because people still like Johnny more. <laughs> and Johnny's admittedly boring. Yeah. He's an amazing tattoo, a cool image. I love when he guesses and stuff, but I really don't care to read about him. <laughs> if, if only it was actually Nicolas Cage. <laughs> if only it, that that's how you save it. Actor Nicolas Cage becomes the spirit of vengeance. <laughs> and then he steals the declaration of independence. <laughs> before taking his face off. <laughs> Lord of War. <laughs> he becomes the ghost rider, the Lord of War. <laughs> I, I love that movie, Lord of War. That's great. Starts, Jared Leto. Yeah, I was about to say, movie. he starts selling weapons with a coked up Jared Leto. Jared Leto. Oh man, I think I think that might be my favorite Jared Leto movie. Actually, he does such a good as the fuck up brother in that movie. <laughs> uh so yeah so i mean that's everything we read this week, Matt. Yeah. We're basically oh wow, we've actually gone over two hours. We have. Jesus, and here I thought with no news these episodes would get shorter, no, but apparently apparently not. we have more content when there's less. <laughs> what, what? How does that even work? I, comics, man, comics. I I guess, man. All right, everyone. It's it's actually even a little later now because we started the show late. So I got to get this rendered up for Patreon and I got to get to bed. But uh, yeah, thank you everyone for watching and listening. It's always appreciated. We're so happy to have you every week here. And, you know, Matt and I, we just want to keep delivering yet yeah, great content the way we are, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I do want to also give a shout out to uh, Colin Shepard, who's who actually for the second time, uh, not this month, but last uh, for the second month in a row, uh, has donated to my coffee page. Hey, thanks, Colin. Yes, I know Colin a lot, too. So, yes. yeah, Matt and I both have those. Uh, naturally, if you are a patron for as little as a dollar a month, you'll get to listen to this show before anyone else. Uh, show for everyone else normally goes live Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the video version. You can get the audio the next day over on SoundCloud and iTunes, and I know lots of people do. In fact, our downloads have been very high recently, so thank you, everyone, who listens to the show over there on SoundCloud. Awesome. And if you listen to it on iTunes, give us another rating there. I think it's been a while since people have liked or starred the show, so <laughs> do that. We'd appreciate it. Yeah. We can't do it ourselves. No, well, we could, but it'd take too much effort yeah it would be a little multiple I, accounts I, I, I just yeah i just learned to work itunes not that long i don't ago. even use itunes there you go i i'm using it now more than i ever have before because i had to set up an account to put the show there yeah. i'm like all right let me curate all of my podcasts but of course i can't get it on my phone because my phone isn't an, an apple and it's a whole deal yeah but i like knowing when my favorite shows have uh, new podcasts yeah I was screwing around with Simplecast, actually. Simplecast is a great app. I wish I started with that because it has a really great rollout for everything and basically limitless from the first, like, tier. The only problem with it, though, is that they don't accept PayPal. Oh, really? Why? Yes, as I... I have no idea. SoundCloud is one of the only ones that accept PayPal, which naturally, because Matt and I get paid digitally, mm -hmm. it's the best way to run yeah. that. So, so they'll just take it out every month usually not too long after I've gotten paid, so it's actually a really great uh, way to do it. But as I've discovered from some people who work in podcasts, they're like, oh, you know, certain ad people don't want to give you ad time if you're on SoundCloud because they don't trust the analytics on SoundCloud, apparently. Okay. Now, this person might have just been talking pure bullshit to me, I don't know, to make me move the show somewhere else, <laughs> but 
that's what they said and now and, and now i'm just rambling again i was ending the show <laughs> i was ending the show is what i was doing <laughs> Thank you for listening, everyone. Matt and I will be back again next week with more stuff. Uh, again, too, if you are a patron, sorry that it actually comes out a little later now. Matt's actually doing some audio wizardry behind the scenes, so if the show sounds better in the last couple of weeks, that's why. Yeah, yeah, it takes a little bit longer, but it's worth it. All right, so we'll see you all again next week, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye.